Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board for Monday, February 7th, 2022. This is Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan. Yes. John Hurd. Yes. Len Diggins. Yes. Eric Helmuth. Yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine. Yes. Doug Heim. Yes. And Board Administrator Ashley Meyer is participating remotely. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act signed into law on June 16th, 2021, that extends certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. The act includes an extension until April 1, 2022 of the remote meeting provision provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for, for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. Finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. We have 17 items on the board's agenda this evening. Let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. I'll now turn to the next item on the agenda, item two, to review and approve bond issue, bond anticipation note and related matters. Uh, comes in three parts. Part A, determination of maximum useful life of capital asset to be financed. Award sale of the $82,445,000 general obligation municipal purpose loan of 2022 bonds dated February 24th, 2022 to JP Morgan LLC at the net interest rate of 2.416% and see all related documents required to execute the sale. Uh, joining us for this agenda item is our town treasurer, Phyllis Marshall. Uh, good evening, Ms. Marshall. Good evening, thank you. I, I wanna start by um, pointing out that uh, we uh, had the AAA bond rating reaffirmed again. And um, uh, so it's a great moment for us and I appreciate the, the teamwork that went into getting that uh, affirmation. Um, we sold the bonds and there were seven bids. They were all very, uh, very close. Um, the winning bid was uh, a rate of 2.416. And the range of bid, the, the highest bid was 2.639. So they're very, very tight. And that's always a good indicator that you have a good market and a good um, competitive bid. Um, the, um, this issue includes 75 million for the next step of the high school, and as well as 11.2 million for the DPW facility. Um, we borrowed 21.5 last time for the DPW. So um, there are also some other projects that were included in the um, annual town meeting vote last year. Those include the engineering study for buildings in the um, school district, um, school bus, Winmore Park improvements, and uh, a dump truck for the DPW, which we're going to vote on next, and also for the Parmenter exterior improvements. So I, um, if you have any questions of me, that'd be great. I'd like to hear them. And um, I would ask for your favorable consideration of this um, sale of bond. Great, 
Thank you, Ms. Marshall. I'll turn it to the board to, uh, for any questions or comments. Uh, and I'll start with Mr. Diggins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, mean, I would like to move uh, approval of the sale of the bonds. I mean, and I have one um, quick question um, for the treasurer through you. Um, and that is, um, we will see something similar next year at this time, right? Yes. Okay, great. So I'll save my question for next year. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Helmut. Thank you. I happily second that. I appreciate, as always, the fine work by our finance department and leadership for, for that bond rating, which is so important to uh, making this feasible for us. So thanks for your good work. No questions. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one quick question. I'd like to ask Ms. Marshall if she knows. Um, is this down? Yeah, this down. Oh, my Lord. Is the town still on track um, for fully funding contributory retirement by 2035? Yes, I believe so. I think and, that and, was. Sorry, go ahead. Yes, that was shared with the uh, with Standard and Poor's when we spoke with them. Okay, and, and we have till 2040 to do it. So we're still on track for finishing five years early. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Um, happy to support it. Uh, no questions. We just say that, you know, it's nice to drive by the new high school and every time you drive by, it seems to be huge chunks of it that is done that wasn't done before. So this is one uh, bond issue that we could certainly drive down the street and see the, the benefits of what we're voting on. So appreciate that. And thank you, Ms. Marshall, for all your work. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, and um, yeah, I, I also will support this. And I do want to congratulate you on the AAA bond rating. Congratulate the town manager and the, and the, the entire team for that. That's uh, great news. Um, just a question for you or for Attorney Heim. Is it just one vote that we have to take to approve the sale? We have the motion to approve the sale of the bonds. Is there, are there any other motions that we need on this one? Okay, all right, so it's just a one motion. So on a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Heim. Just to be clear for the record for anybody, uh, uh, Ms. Marshall was indicating no, and I agree with that assessment. <clears throat> okay, on the motion, uh, Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. And the team, the finance team, thanks. Great. Uh, okay, item three this evening is the fiscal 2022 second quarter financial report. Sandy Pooler, Deputy Town Manager, Ida Cody, Comptroller. Okay, they should both be joining us. See Mr. Pooler. Good evening, Mr. Pooler. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Um, thank Good you evening, for Mr. having Pooler. me and Ida here tonight. Um, tonight, I will be presenting the uh, second quarter report. Um, Ida and I have gotten into a little rhythm here where we switch off which of us actually does the presentation. Uh, last time it was Ida. Did, so she gets the uh, odd quarters and I get the even quarters. Um, let's see what we can do with that. Um, all right, uh, so we are halfway through the year, which means uh, we should be at spending and uh, revenue rates at, of 50%. Uh, overall, I would just say that uh, we don't have any Budgetary problems with our spending. I think we're all in line. Uh, some of the, the departments have spent over 50%, but that uh, is for explainable reasons and is consistent with their operations in previous years. Some of our revenue, uh, most of our revenue is at or above 50%, and there are some that are slightly lagging that, but again, it's consistent with what we've seen in the past. Um, in this memo, Ida and I outline um, and, and call out expenses that are at or above 
60% of budget to date. In other words, when there's more than a 10% variance from uh, where we should be this time of year. Um, and you can see these all listed uh, in the memo. Um, I, I think unlike in the past, I don't think I'll go through each one except to say that um, overall there have been um, faster expenses from some departments because of the way they do business, such as encumbering large costs in IT or DPW uh, for their software or for their trash collections at the beginning of the year. Um, same thing for facilities as they encumber a lot of their utility and repair accounts. Uh, the bottom one on this first page is the health department uh, where it's expended 70% of this, its budget. Um, some of that comes from prepaying its mosquito control expenses, but a lot of it comes from the department having a substantial number of COVID related expenses that will be reimbursed by various sources, some of which we've undertaken as reimbursing health department already in January. Others we still need to apply for things like FEMA reimbursement. Um, it is one of the few departments that still has substantial COVID expenses in its operating budget on the general fund side. Um, so that, that's why I wanted to call that one out. Um, and then um, finally Council on Aging, um, they made a big rent payment up front in the beginning of the year. So that was uh, why that's higher. Our other expenses, uh, debt, our Minuteman assessments, pension, and our insurance. Uh, again, uh, all fall uh, when those costs are due. Debt, we traditionally sold a lot of our debt in um, December's in years past. We now sell most of it in February, but from our old debt, a lot of it still shows up in the first half of the year. The Minuteman payment uh, is made in accordance with an agreement we have and the regional agreement that says, by this time of year, we have to have uh, paid out 60% of what we owe. Pensions, we always pay at the beginning of the year and liability insurance, uh, we pay uh, a lot of that upfront too. That's the expense side. On the um, revenue side, our collections are still strong. Uh, we're just under 50% uh, in taxes, which is normal for this time of year because the first two real estate taxes are estimated bills. The second two are actual bills and they tend to come up a little higher when we finally have the actuals. Motor vehicle excise is actually a little higher this year than it has been other years. Uh, we still have not put out our biggest motor vehicle excise tax bill and we'll expect to see that in the third quarter. All the other things uh, are, are coming in, I think right on target are our biggest uh, local receipt after motor vehicle excise or licensing permits, and we've already collected 93% of those. Our hotel tax is coming in at 110% of what we estimated, so we find that positive, and meals taxes are coming in strong. Both hotel and motel tax, we still have lower than usual estimates from previous years, where we'll we're bringing those up over time. The marijuana uh, tax is at 72%, that's been a strong, uh, collection rate for us. It's a nice new source of revenue. Um, so we're welcoming in that. Investment on earnings are down below where we'd like to see them. Right now we have 25% of our estimated revenue in. Part of that is because we don't have November or December's uh, interest in yet. It takes a while. There's always a lag with uh, earnings on investment as the bank accounts come in and then the treasurer's office has to distribute those in investment earnings out to various funds. Um, I would say overall, this is something that we're keeping a close eye on because um, it is even accounting for that shortfall in November and December, I think that they are um, falling behind what they've been in previous years. I'm gonna move on to the enterprise funds. Um, water and sewer, uh, we've expended 57% of the budget and collected 54% of our revenue. Uh, this has been a wet year, so people have used less water. Um, so we are, we are lagging in our revenue. Um, so it will be important as we go into the next revenue year to make sure that we get those rates filed 
and enacted on a timely basis as the board has done very well for the last couple of years. Um, there is a substantial fund balance in the water and sewer fund, so I'm not worried about um, its overall performance, but it is just notable that our collection is lagging a little bit. Uh, the other funds are doing well. Uh, AYCC uh, is spending and collecting about equal rates. Uh, COA transportation is um, also not transporting as many people as it has when the senior center has been open. We expect that to rebound once it does open, uh, but on a financial basis, they're doing well. Um, the rink has expended 68% of its budget and collected 31%. I've looked back on several past years. This is a normal collection rate because they collect a lot. Of, I mean, they collect all the revenue in the winter. And even in January, I looked and, and they've already um, started to bring in substantial revenue in, in January. So I've looked at it. I talked to Joe Connolly, the rent director about it. I think they're on target and I'm not worried about that. Uh, in a similar way, the recreation budget has this sort of funny phenomenon where it spends a lot of money in the summer to covering summer programs where the revenue from that came in in the previous year in the spring. So we always have upfront a lot of spending. The revenue tends to come in during the year and then have a big revenue hit in the spring as we collect summer uh, revenue. So again, we've looked at this comparing it to previous years. I've talked to Joe Connolly about it. Um, he does his own forecasts and we've compared notes. And so I think the recreation fund uh, will be in good shape. Um, they've certainly been very active this year. And so I think we've been happy with that. I think those are the major things we've seen in the budget. You can see the numbers. Uh, we do produce this every quarter for the select board and send it to the finance committee. Um, these are the numbers department by department for spending. Um, the next group down are the big others, their transfers, reserve fund assessments. Next are warrant articles. And I put in the budgets here, the original budgets um, as voted at town meeting without um, the sort of carryover that we usually allow, which you will see on the Munis report, we allow the warrant articles to kind of carry over two years of budget at a time because they are run by citizens. And as I said before, sometimes it takes them a little while to process their payments. Uh, but I think we're certainly on track for all of that. And then um, you'll see the numbers for our, um, our revenue. Um, and um, again, everything is pretty much on track there. Uh, and then finally, you just see the summation of the numbers for the enterprise funds. Um, and uh, you see the total expenses and encumbrances, which we then total together for the percent used. We break down revenue and in, uh, into direct revenue from fees and then any transfers, uh, such as in the water fund, the $1.8 million in subsidy from the general fund. This will be the last year you're gonna see that. Um, that all goes away in accordance with the policy that the board voted. Um, but uh, again, I think we feel pretty comfortable about all of our numbers. So having said all that, uh, if there are questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them or either be ha happy to answer any questions that anybody has. I would just ask Edith if there's anything at this point you would like to add. Hi, good evening. Oops. Uh, no, not much to add. Actually, um, Sandy covered everything. Um, just two things I want to mention. Um, the interest, like Sandy said, we haven't posted it yet because um, we had a bank takeover. Eastern took over Century, so the treasurer wanted to make sure that all accounts are unbalanced before they post the, the interest. So we need to do a thorough reconciliation before we post this two months. Um, also, we still have about $135,000 in um, um, health and human services that are related to a vaccine and testing, and we're hoping to recoup this amounts from FEMA and from um, um, ARPA. And um, uh, finally, we received the last tranche of um, CARES money, um, and um, that completes the, the CARES allocation from the state. 
thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pooler. Thank, thank you, Ms. Cody. And before I turn to board members, I want to congratulate Ms. Cody. Um, Mrs. Mahan and I are on the audit committee and uh, we attended a meeting, I think since the last time that we saw you and the audit for last year's financial statements came back with a clean opinion and, and uh, really strong comments from the outside auditors. So congratulations to you and your team and to the whole finance team uh, for that. That was great news uh, for us to receive. Um, so I will start with board members and uh, I will turn to Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Um, you know, I should know this. this is my second one, but do we do a motion for receipt on these? Yes. Then I will happily move receipt. Um, I thought that was such a fantastic presentation that I have no questions. Thanks for your good work. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will definitely second my colleague, Mr. Helmuth's motion to receive. And the only question I have pretty much has been answered, but it was on um, the earnings on investments. I, my question was, you know, why haven't we posted November, December, and Ms. Cody, um, along with Mr. Poole's report, just explained with the change in banks and wanting to take the time. Uh, Um, a little trouble hearing you, Mrs. Mahan, with the connection. I think we lost her. She's frozen. Okay. Thanks for me. I'll, yeah, I'll return to Mrs. Mahan in, in a moment. Um, yeah, we lost her connection. And I'll turn to Mr. Hurd. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Ms. Cody and Mr. Pula. Um, you know, I do always enjoy these presentations. I'm glad we were able to institute this as a regular occurrence quarterly. Seems like they come up a lot more than quarterly, but just, I guess we look forward to them so much. Um, but we have a lot of budgets to go through tonight, but I wanna thank you for your presentation and all your continued work. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, I'll return to, I think we have Mrs. Mahan back. So I'll return to Mrs. Mahan. Actually, I'm going to follow up with Mr. Pooler and Ms. Cody tomorrow on my questions. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, so I just need some really short questions because every time we go through this, I just see new things, you know, or sometimes they are apparent to me because of conversations uh, that I've had with um, residents. The display of flags, I see that we haven't spent anything. Is that because of the um, pandemic? Do we normally spend money on flags about this time of year? Or, or, or the other, the other part of the question is, is that kind of backloaded, meaning like we start spending them around Patriots Day? And, um, it's in the Warren articles. I'm fairly, if I, if I may, Mr. Chair, I'm fairly certain from conversations I've had with Mr. Chunglo that most of those expenditures come around Memorial Day. Okay. So I, gotcha. I believe that's when you'll start to see um, expenditures from that fund. Gotcha, gotcha. I'm a little concerned about ACAC. So, so I mean, I didn't look at the muni part. I mean, so you you mentioned that the you allow um, uh, some of the um, entities to um, you know have two years. I mean, not roll one year to the next. I mean, so I, I hope they're not in as much trouble as it looks like I mean, from ninety four percent. No, I, I don't think they're in trouble. I just think, uh, which one were you looking at there? Um, uh, Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture. Oh, uh, no, I think it's just um, there. Uh, I've shown the original budget at 30,000 because that's what you're used to seeing in the warrant. But the spending could be both from that 30,000 from this year and some other money from the previous year. Okay. So uh, I think they're fine. All right. And, uh, what, I just what, want, yeah, please, go ahead. I, I just want to add that typically we look at when they get the appropriation and if the money is not spent within two years, then it has to go back to the free cash. But most of the times they spend it over two years. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so I don't think I've asked this question uh, before. What's reclassification? It's also... That, uh, is an article that uh, when people uh, 
have their position changed, in other words, they move from one position to another, uh, they are reclassed and that requires a vote of town meeting. Uh, there's an initial appropriation with that article at the time that people are changing their, their positions. And um, then we incorporate those dollar changes into the department's budgets going forward. So if I ask this question again, just tell me, go back and look at the video. Okay, and the last question is um, uh, on um, the, the, the fees. I mean, um, they are high, you know, you said the highest in 10 years, just, that, uh, just from your, your experience. Are those a predictor or anything you think? I mean, you said that they are associated with building uh, permits and all. Do you think they are predictive of anything? Um, I think the um, inspections department has been doing a very good job of, um, of doing their fundamental work. They've also instituted a policy of requiring contractors to sign affidavits affirming the true cost of projects. And I think that has probably made the fees that we uh, take in be a little bit higher because the numbers are more accurate. Okay. All right, all right. That, that 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 I remember that from from last time. So so um, yeah, I think Mr. Jameson will be pleased. Yeah. So so thank you very much. Well done, Mr. Chair. Thank thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, and and thank you again for the presentation this evening. Just a quick question. You touched on it on the the reimbursements for COVID expenses, and you mentioned several departments. I know it's a health department. What what other departments might see reimbursement, whether it's uh, CARES Act, FEMA, or ARPA funding? Um, some of the department, we have some uh, expenses that we have already classed in the school department. Um, we also had in the, um, some capital projects that we uh, reclassified. Um, we had in um, um, Council on Aging and some expenses of recreation as well. And we also, in the town manager, we had some reimburses, reimbursements for Zoom calls, for example, for the Zoom mm -hmm. uh, membership. Okay. But that level of detail is all in the backup materials and there's a, a line in each department for COVID expenses. But Ida had it exactly right as to uh, those departments where they're likely to find them. Great. Great, thank you very much um, again for the presentation. We look forward to seeing you uh, after the third quarter uh, ends. Uh, so on a, a motion by Mr. Helmuth to receive, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Do you have a Thank you, thank you both. Moving on, item four, fiscal year 2023 town manager's budget presentation. Uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Chapterline for that presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll, I'll keep Sandy here as he may be able to assist me with any questions the board may have. And I have a quick slide deck that I'll run through, but I wanna start by thanking Sandy, Julie Wayman, the whole financial team, and really all the department heads and staff for helping us put together this budget. Um, it is a long, very team oriented process um, and we're lucky to work with a good team. And specifically this year, I wanna call out that Sandy made the decision to empower Julie Wayman, the management analyst in our office to really be the leader of developing this budget, working with department heads, developing all the documents. So, Every, everything you see in the documents is a credit to Julie and the good work that she's been doing for the organization. So I, I wanted to publicly share that so everybody knew what an important role Julie was playing. Um, with that, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So I wanna take this opportunity, hopefully take about 10 minutes or so to talk a little bit about the fiscal 2023 budget proposal, which was submitted to the board and to the finance committee on January 15th per the town manager act. Uh, and then we'll start being heard by the finance committee in late up the town meeting over the course of the next several months. Oh, let's see if I can get this to advance. 
So in overview of what I'm gonna talk about, I wanna highlight the process that we go through both internally and then externally to both develop and request consideration and hopefully approval of the budget. I wanna give an overview of both uh, projected revenues and expenditures or uh, budgeted expenditures for the FY23 budget. I wanna share some highlights talking about the board continuing to maintain its commitments as part of this four year long range plan uh, that we're currently in. And really highlight that this is a level services budget, uh, budget with very few, with a, a handful of targeted investments. Talk a little bit about the continuing long-term outlook of the town's finances and then next steps for this budget. So to talk a little bit about the budget process, it's really a year round process. For those who don't know, the town's fiscal year begins every year on July 1st. So our fiscal year is July 1 to June 30. So you can see that's when we start our budget year. Fast forwarding to September, we send out a memorandum in August asking that capital budget requests be sent into the town manager's office uh, in September. In November, we expect the same of the operating budgets. And on top of that, we have those requests submitted, and then we meet with each individual department to go over their budget requests as we formulate the actual budget proposal. As I mentioned, in January on the 15th, we provide the budget books to the select board and the finance committee. Starting in late January or into February, all the way through April, the finance committee holds public hearings on the budget. In March, the town manager's office produces the financial plan and share that with the select board and finance committee. Usually by the end of March, that's the more robust document that carries both performance metrics, goals and objectives for each department's organizational charge, as well as proposed budgetary figures. Next in April, the finance committee report is submitted to town meeting for consideration at the annual town meeting. In May, um, if we're fortunate, town meeting will adopt the operating and capital budgets. And then the fiscal year closes on June 30th and it all starts again. So as I said, it's really a 12 month cycle of preparing and managing and preparing and managing the budget throughout the year. So let's talk a little bit about what the FY23 budget looks like from again, a revenue projection point of view and then an expenditure projection point of view. So what you see on the screen right here are our revenue projections. And this is really a snapshot of what I think most of you have seen also in the town's long range planning document where we conservatively budget revenues and then control our expenditures as best possible with spending caps on our discretionary expending, uh, expenditure areas. So this year you see between FY 22 and 23, an increase of property tax going up by about 1.5%. Normally it grows between about two and a half and 3%, but this year is the last year that we're reducing the MWRA debt shift as Sandy mentioned earlier. And that's why when, when that 1.8 million is taken out of the tax levy, you don't see, see the same year over year growth as you might expect. Local receipts, that's again, this is great, great lead in with Sandy's presentation that those are all the non-tax revenues we collect, motor vehicle excise, building permit fees and everything else you described. You see a projected growth of $352,000, about 4%. That's a little more than we budget on an ongoing basis for an increase, but we're still catching up from where we saw revenues slide during the pandemic. So as we see revenues rebound, we're budgeting that rebound accordingly. State aid, primarily what's in that state aid line is chapter 70, which, uh, which is education aid from the state, as well as unrestricted general government aid or UGA, which frankly feels ridiculous to say, but that's the, that's the acronym chosen by the state. Uh, the budget that you all had submitted to you showed a, just about a 1% growth in state aid. However, after the budget submission on January 15th, the governor released his budget in which there were larger increases to both chapter 70 than what we had budgeted, as well as larger increases to unrest unrestricted general government aid. We're gonna continue to advocate with our state legislators for even larger increases, especially for UGA. But for right now, we've updated figures to represent the governor's budget. Below that, you see ARPA funds budgeted, as I believe we've mentioned at several past select board meetings, 
changes in the federal rules are going to allow us to use up to $10 million total for revenue loss from the town's ARPA allocation. So we've planned to program 5 million of that as a revenue in FY23. And then in future documents, you would see another $5 million for FY24. Below that, you see free cash. Free cash, as we often joke, is neither free nor cash. It's really the town's operating surplus at the end of every year. Whatever we collect in excess revenue or don't spend from budgeted amounts rolls into the town's free cash. And the town's longstanding financial policy has been to use 50% of the prior year's certified free cash as an operating revenue. So that five and a half million dollar figure you see is exactly half of the free cash as was certified this year. Other funds, that $400,000 amount is actually overlay surplus. So each year we ask the assessors to identify what they can give back to the town from their overlay account. And for this year, we are budgeting the same as last year, $400,000. And then finally, you see the override stabilization fund. At the start of our long range plans, we're making deposits into the override stabilization fund. At the end of long range plans, we're making withdrawals from the override stabilization fund. So you can see in this instance, both last year in FY22, again in FY23, we're making a withdrawal from the override stabilization fund. Perfectly within the plan and what we expected to happen when the, when the long range plan was set in place back in FY19. And then one more thing I'll note, below that you see what's called transfers and offsets. Those are the funds that we take from the enterprise funds to offset general fund costs associated with the work that general fund departments put forth in supporting those enterprise funds. Moving forward for expenditures, you can see we have uh, broken it down to a number of categories, uh, municipal departments, we have, I, I believe there's in, incorporated in there the elections. What am I looking at there? Oh, excuse me, sorry. See municipal departments appropriations offset by that same figure of the water sewer uh, offset costs for a municipal departments total of just about $40 million growing at 3% for FY23. Previously as part of the long range plan, we were allowed to grow at three and a quarter percent, but we have limited growth this year to 3% as we try to best prepare for the override, um, which is still to be considered for FY24 and beyond. For the school department, after a long series of discussions with the long range planning committee, which includes school committee members and members of the school administration, we are proposing in this budget a 5.42% increase in the school department. We have taken a look at enrollment over the past couple of years. We've tracked both enrollment increases and now enrollment decreases. And after resetting the base based on the school department's actual enrollment, funding the strategic plan that's been set forth by the school committee, funding COVID remediation funds, increasing general, um, excuse me, general education spending by three and a half percent, special education by seven percent we reach a cumulative year over year increase for the school department of 5.42%, uh, which when you're limited by proposition two and a half is a very robust increase for the school department budget for FY23. Below that, we see the Minuteman school going up by a very significant percentage. That's really driven by two factors. One uh, is increases in the debt service associated with the new building that is still rolling on as well as larger than previously expected enrollment figures for Arlington students at the Minuteman School. Pensions and health care are next. Uh, you see that's collectively going up by six and a quarter percent next year. You see the capital budget, which includes uh, debt service, even exempt debt service um, for uh, the high school and other uh, debt excluded projects. You see the MWRA debt shift being zeroed out. You see the warrant articles, of which the lion's share of that are the funds that we deposit into the OPEB or the Retiree Healthcare Trust Fund. You see our operating reserve fund, which we mostly set aside to cover snow and ice cost overages that aren't budgeted within the DPW budget. And then you see the override stabilization fund deposit, which again, uh, this year we're not projecting in FY23 to make a deposit. I should, I wanna just quickly note, actually I'll go back. 
you see a deposit there into the override stabilization fund. Those are actually funds that we set aside last year in case school enrollment rebounded far beyond levels that we expected. It has not. So those funds that we set aside at this upcoming Springtown meeting, we'll be asking to put into the override stabilization fund so that they can drive the budget in years ahead. So I mentioned that I wanted to touch on maintaining the board's override commitments. Uh, there's a series of commitments that I know board members are aware of when the override was put on the ballot a number of years ago. I think they're all maintained. I know they're all maintained through the recommendation of this budget. Uh, we're continuing to exercise fiscal discipline while maintaining services across all departments. The budget maintains the investments that were committed to as part of building Arlington's future. Those are the high school project, the strategic, uh, strategic plan funded by the school committee, $200,000 a year being put towards mobility and $50,000 a year being put towards senior transportation. There's separate actions that this board has taken to try to minimize uh, the impact of the tax rate on seniors. So it's not part of this budget, but it is an ongoing process and, and many of the actions that have been adopted by town meeting are now in effect. And also this budget maintains the board's commitment of keeping at least, and it's actually significantly beyond a 5% financial reserve for the duration of the four-year plan. So what's contained in this budget? Like I said before, this is almost entirely a level services budget. We received a significant amount of requests from departments, which I think is an honest reflection of need that they see in the community. But because of our desire to control costs and stay within, stay within the lines of the long range plan, we really were only able to fund very targeted investments. The first one and the biggest one was being able to sign a three-year extension for our recycling and trash contract. There's been years of concern as recycling markets have sort of been topsy-turvy with the recycling market in China collapsing a number of years ago, that we could have a very, very significant increase in our recycling and trash costs when we renew. We were seeing, we, we currently pay $0 per ton of recycling. We were seeing communities such as even Boston agreeing to contracts paying over $100 a ton for recycling. And we generally produce about 6,500 tons of recycling a year. So just orders of magnitude, we were, we were girding for what could have been a half a million dollar or more budgetary impact when we renewed. Fortunately, due to the real excellent diligence of Charlotte Milan, the recycling coordinator, and DPW director Mike Rademacher, They've been, able to, they've been able to negotiate a renewal with Jerem again for three years. The first year grows at 9%, which is not insignificant, but far smaller than the figures we were concerned it would grow by during those more tumultuous times in the recycling market. And then in years two and three, grow by two and a half percent, which is very manageable um, within the confines of the long range plan. We're also planning to make an investment in DPW modernization through the establishment of a systems analyst GIS director position in the DPW department. It'll be a position very similar to the one once uh, filled by Adam Krawski, but that position in IT has been transitioned to a project manager position. So we've now <clears throat> decided to program that position in DPW to really give them the tools they need to begin modernizing some of their systems. We're making a targeted investment in accessibility. What we've proposed to do is enhance the existing DEI administrative assistant position to serve as a full ADA coordinator to both work with Jill Harvey as the uh, director of DEI and work with the Disability Commission to advance accessibility initiatives across town. And then finally, we've proposed making an investment in regulatory support by enhancing the existing ZBA staff position to create a full-time position as opposed to a part-time position that can really meet both the technical and administrative needs of both the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Arlington Historical Commission. So where does that leave us looking forward? Um, we've, we have maintained the four-year the four plan, the override, which was in 2009, went into effect, uh, 2019, excuse me, went into effect in FY20, projects to last through FY23, as had been planned. 
So there are early discussions about what a potential override would look like in FY24 already occurring at the Long Range Planning Committee. In this budget, we continue to invest in both our pension and OPEB liabilities, as Mrs. Mahan actually asked during the, the prior presentation. We continue to, mo uh, to monitor enrollment in the school department. As mentioned earlier, it has dipped in past years, but is projecting to rebound. So we wanna make sure that this plan acknowledges that uh, or the long range plan acknowledges that and it does. And we're gonna to continue to need to advocate for new and varied revenue sources from the state, <clears throat> whether it be our home rule petition for a deeds excise fee, for increased UGA, increased chapter 70, or maybe even in the future, some local option taxes for consideration. We th think if there's any chance of us minimizing our structural deficit, we're gonna to need to continue that advocacy. So where do we go from here? Um, we have further long range planning meetings and a budget and revenue task force scheduled for February and March. Hearings with the finance committee are actually beginning, I believe tonight. So we're, we're very timely in that regard. The group insurance commission is gonna set its rates at its March 3rd meeting. And once we get those rates, we'll be able to finalize our health insurance spending for next year. And then all of these figures will be updated in coordination with the finance committee in preparation for town meeting and presentation of a budget in April. So with that, I think I went a little longer than I probably expected, but I'll close my presentation and be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Chapter Lane. Um, I'll turn it over to board members for questions. Um, I'll start with Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think I heard from the town manager a motion to approve. Um, the town's budget submission or just receive? I think receive is, is appropriate at this point. Okay, all right, move receipt first off. Thank you. Um, in a lot of my questions, I've had the opportunity under long range planning, as well as looking forward to the um, budget revenue task force that the chairman will be. Um, it, if I still have a cable connection, in terms of the, I don't know if it was 1.4 or 1.6 under enrollment um, that, the manager spoke about, is that something that can be done at the regular town meeting or a special town meeting? So I actually spoke with town council. And so just to be clear, you're asking about the enrollment set aside, moving that back into the override stabilization yes. fund. <clears throat> so I actually talked okay. with town council about that today and we did agree we should be able to do that within the annual town meeting. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chaplain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Happy to second that. Um, thank you for the presentation. You did touch on a number of my questions during the presentation. Um, you mentioned the the senior circuit breaker and increased eligibility for the property tax deferral program. Have, have we seen the past year or so an increase in participation or has it leveled off? Does it seem like the war is getting out there to seniors that these programs are available to them? So, you know, I, I, if Phyllis was still here, I would actually ask her what she has seen for deferrals. Um, Sandy, do you have a sense? Do you mind, Mr. Chair, if I pitch to Sandy to see if he has a sense? Yeah, that's no problem. And I um, certainly could follow up if you don't have the answer in front of you. I'm just sort of generally to see if, I mean, we're doing our job to let people know that that is out there. Uh, I know that they have implemented the new higher um, Tax deferral numbers. I don't know what the num what the participation levels are. We can certainly find that out for you. Um, and the circuit breaker uh, is still has not been implemented because there was some concerns about its interaction with what the state was doing. I think the state just moved to increase the circuit breaker amount. Um, and okay. so, all right. Thank you. And then we talked. A little bit about the enrollment growth, um, Ms. Chaplin. So, is, has it been steady over the past? I assume, you know, last year is when you saw the, the major drop off. And then, has it increased at all, or is it still steady from where it was in 2020? So, it, there, as you said, um, there was a significant drop off the first year of the pandemic. Yeah. And then for this school year, there was a rebound but they did not even rebound to the level of the pre-pandemic. 
Mm -hmm. There's still there's still 189. Is that the right number, Sandy? 189 students less than they were before the pandemic. Okay, and I assume it will go up. I was just curious to see if there's a more lasting effect where some people transferred out and liked where they were, and, and it would level off a little bit. But only time will tell with that. Um, then, are the projections for revenue for the hotel meals tax? Where are those relative to pre-COVID projections? As far as a percentage, I know with each year since over the past couple, we put them down, we set it lower and we're increasing it bit by bit. But are we still 50% below pre-COVID, 25%, 75%? I think we're getting back up to almost full uh, pre-COVID budgets with, with our increase of that, you know, catching back up to that with that $350,000 amount. But Yep. Sandy, I th I, you, it appears as though you're you're looking at something, Sandy, on your screen. I, I'm looking at a spreadsheet here. So, uh, over the past five years, we've averaged um, about four hundred and thirty thousand dollars in um, meals taxes, and we set our meals tax revenue forecast at four ten for this year. Over uh, the last few five years. Uh, we've averaged 354,000 in um, hotel tax. Uh, that has lagged more uh, in this year and last year. So we set the budgeted amount at 170,000 for this year. Yep. So um, it's just the hotel tax is just taking a while to come back. Thank you. All right. And then the only last question I had is, so in the budget book that I had, for fiscal year 2023, it had a contribution from the stabilization fund of about 4.2 million. And it looked like in the presentation it was 3.1 million. Is that relative to the school set aside? I think that's relative to the state aid change. So because okay. we because state aid went up as a revenue, we didn't need to take as much out of the override stabilization fund to balance the budget. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Sorry about that. I just needed to cough. I didn't think you all wanted to hear that. Uh, so um, first off, I, mean, I, I want to say that um, um, elevating Ms. Wayman into the position of control in this process is what's called a no-brainer. I mean, uh, she is just so good. I mean, uh, had a chance of, uh, to work with her uh, uh, at the first uh, uh, vir virtual town meeting. I mean, and and uh, I mean, her level of competence um, is just really stellar. So I just kind of figured she was highly involved anyways, but congratulations to her on that. And also, uh, I appreciate the town manager pointing out the great work that Ms. Milan and um, uh, uh, and, and Mr. Rademacher did on the, on the recycling. Because when I was... Um, Running and sitting had the, the ability to sit in on the long range uh, um, planning meetings. Me, which unfortunately, when you get elected, you can't do it because you're then you know it, it has an open meeting law issue. But those are really great meetings, you know. And I became aware of that problem then, and and it's just one of those like awful situations where you know you want to recycle, but then you know you get we're seemingly penalized for it. I use that word loosely. I mean, so I'm really happy that they were able to to um, um, help out with that. And, and I'll say to um, uh, Mr. Hurd's question about the um, the deferrals. I mean, um, it was at one of our civic engagement group meetings. I mean, one of the participants said, he, and this is anecdotal, he just said that uh, a lot of seniors that he knows he, that don't do the deferrals. It's not like they don't know about it. They just don't want to do it because they want to pass along, you know, as much value mean uh, of their property mean to their kids mean. So, so it may be more than just people not knowing and, and that we may need, you know, well, maybe more. I don't know what to say beyond that. Uh, and third, I want to say, or maybe it's fourth. I mean, um, we're close to the end. Uh, is, is that? Um, I, I applaud the spending on on schools. I mean, uh, I mean it was higher than you know the three and a half percent or or whatever you know we try to aim for. Uh, but but you know, taking care of the kids and educating the kids is is the most important thing that we do. I mean, and and and, and having more kids. I mean, in order to you know have 
just to help the species, I mean, is, is one of those things to do and, and necessary. You know, I don't have kids, but I love kids. I mean, and, and every time I work or do something with Arlington kids, you know, I just feel so good. You know, and that's particularly the case because I'm working with some on the study committee I mean, for the youth and young adult advisory group. So anything that we can do as a community, you know, to um, educate and, and provide more support uh, for our kids. I really applaud. And lastly, it's a question, um, and that is, where is it that we can find on the website the list of requests um, from the departments? So I I don't have that published, but I can I can produce that, and we could we could put that into a, a postable format. Okay, only if it doesn't take too much effort and 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 at your convenience. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmut. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things. One is just a detail. And if you happen to have this off the top of your head, if you don't, that's fine. But you mentioned that the the renewal that we got in, from JRM the first year was a nine percent increase, which was a lot better. Do you can, do you have to know a rough dollar figure for what that represents um, up against you know the, the increase we were afraid of? So that is pro approximately. I can just punch some quick numbers into here. Uh, it's an approximately $225,000 overall increase, which is probably only about $180,000 more than we expected okay. because we, we would have expected a two or two and a half percent increase anyways. So it's probably, you know, if in a good best mid case scenario, a third of the impact that we had feared. Great, yeah. I mean, considering the recycling market, that's that's some wizardry in the part of uh, Ms. Milan and Mr. Ronemacher, the rest of the team. So that's uh, that's a big win. Um, my second question is: um, so I saw that the the five million dollars from ARPA for the general fund is is in there. Where is that plugging in? And I think specifically, um, you know, I don't see any obvious places where you know it didn't. We're not changing um, or putting into the override stabilization fund, or, or um, that doesn't appear to be changing what we're withdrawing from it. Is at this point, do you see that five million having a direct or an indirect effect on the long range plan and, and the, specifically the duration of, of our current four year plan? So I would say two primary things in response to that. Um, one, directly to your question. It is extending, it's not extending the life of the long range plan. It is decreasing the size of a future override. Okay. Because it is not, it's not enough. Well, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say that. There's a, there's a chance depending on how the budgets go that an override wouldn't be absolutely necessary in FY24. Mm -hmm. And these funds are mostly the reason why that that would be the case. But as the town considered last time, part of the long-term math of an override is collecting it over a certain number of years because it's the it's sort of, it's the number of years at which you collect an override amount that really what is what drives or powers a long-range plan's longevity. Mm -hmm. So, at least in terms of how I would say the long-range plan uh, long-range planning committee has been thinking about it. It would the, the the five million in FY23 and using the five million in FY24 would be primarily used to reduce the amount of a future override. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing I would say is that when Sandy has run numbers based on Federal Treasury's model of how to calculate revenue replacement, when you look at from the start of the pandemic to the end of the ARPA period. And I know he's been sort of noodling with this model. But we've lost about $10.4 million. Mm -hmm. So to some degree, our argument would be is that if the pandemic had never happened, we would have collected some portion of these monies anyways. So I, I only share that as an argument mm -hmm. for why, in general, we wouldn't want to use one-time funds for operating costs. Mm -hmm. But these are called revenue replacement costs for a reason because it is literally replacing revenue that we would have otherwise collected if the pandemic didn't occur. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's, I'm glad I asked. That's, that's very illuminating. 
Um, and, and finally, um, I'll just pile on. You're absolutely smart to put Julie Wayman uh, in the lead of this project because I have also worked with her a lot as well. And uh, we have a lot of talent in the town and she certainly uh, comes to mind on a short list there. So well done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Again, I want to thank you again, Ms. Chapdelaine, for the budget presentation and, and for the public's benefit. There, there is a detailed budget message and detailed um, budget report within the town manager's website. And he goes through each one of the commitments that were made in fiscal 19, where we stand, and the breakdown of how the school budget, at least in his budget, has um, has grown or, or the projection for next year, because it is a combination of general education, special education, and the cumulative effect of, uh, of, of enrollment. So thank you for that. And, and for those who want to look more, it's there and there's more detail. We've made different references to commitments and, and uh, there's a checklist in terms of how we're doing on the commitments within that. And I find it very helpful um, to see that. And, and just briefly on, on Mr. Helmut's point on the um, what's happened with the $5 million. And, when we go back to fiscal 19, when we had the override, the five-year plan that was in place at that time showed a significant deficit in fiscal 24. With this last rendition and, and changes that Mr. Poole and Mr. Chapelain have made to the numbers based on state aid estimates, there is now no deficit in fiscal 24. We may have to go out in fiscal 23, as Mr. Chapelain said, to get ahead for fiscal 25, but there's no deficit, the deficit begins in fiscal 25. Um, I just want to also say Mr. Chapelain had referenced going forward, um, we will have a meeting of the budget and revenue task force. And I think Mrs. Mahan may be the only member of this board who has attended a budget and revenue task force meeting as a member of the select board. Mr. Hurd may have early in his tenure, but I know Mr. Diggins, Mr. Helmuth and I haven't. Um, that's an opportunity for us to meet with our legislative delegation with the school committee, with finance committee. And we're looking to do that either the last week of February or first week of March. And um, Mr. Chaplin is gonna work on that. We may do it before a select board meeting, but we may do it during the day as well. But we do wanna talk about what's happening with local aid and, and the numbers that we see in the budget now or what the governor proposed. It doesn't mean that the House or Senate couldn't increase that. And, we may want to bring that up at the at the meeting, but that's that's the type of thing we'll be doing going forward. Long range planning will be meeting afterwards, and and um, I just want to thank Mr. Chaplin and Mr. Pooler um, for the work that they're doing. Uh, Mrs. Mahan and I and other members of the long range planning because there's a lot that has gone on these past couple months, and there's still a lot of activity and a lot of things that we're going to have to react to and and, and project as we move forward. And we appreciate. Uh, their presentations uh, on that. So uh, no questions from me, a lot of comments, but uh, th th thank you for the presentation tonight. Um, so on a motion to receive by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Hellman. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Thank you, Mr. Pooler. Thank you, Mr. Chaplain. All right, moving on to item five, a discussion and vote on polling locations. And I believe our town clerk, uh, Ms. Brazil, is going to be joining us for that discussion um, before we have our internal discussion and vote, internal public discussion. Good evening, Ms. Brazil. A little earlier today. Doing all right. Um, so I wanted to let you know that there's been um, <laughs> some confusion. Um, Attorney Heim and I have been um, trying to sort this out. Uh, the there's there was a special act language passed that sort of supplants the standard um, process for a select board designating polling locations. And it sort of was an outgrowth of a lot of people, uh, a lot of communities making changes during the pandemic. Um, uh, and so, uh, but it basically now um, what I need, 
What we need to do tonight is I get a preliminary vote of uh, what the select board would like for all of the polling locations. Um, I'll need to do a very detailed site study to evaluate accessibility and send in a, the report and pictures to the elections division uh, for any new space that we are interested in using. And then um, when that has been okayed, we will, uh, we'll, we may need to take a final vote. Um, and prior to that, um, they seem to be asking for a report, um, just a statement from the board indicating um, that they've looked at it and there, the chain, any change that we're making to a current location wouldn't have a disparate adverse impact on access to the polls on the basis of race, national origin, disability, income, or age. So um, I have some sample language. I, I would be happy to draft that um, for the board, um, but that's sort of the process the state seems to have. And I don't know if, if Attorney Heim wants to add anything to that. It's been a very confusing week trying to sort this out. Attorney Heim? The only thing that I'd add is, is that, um, you know, there, the, the, the way that a special act is read in Congress with a general law uh, can sometimes be prone to some conflicting interpretation. But at the end of the day, the Secretary of State's office is uh, sort of asking us to do something or informing us that we have to do something um, that I didn't necessarily anticipate given my reading of that special act. I think what's critical is what's pretty apparent on its face, which is that Arlington is well positioned um, to make sure that folks have access to the polls. We've already got a lot of data that affirms that. I still think that in order to avoid any concern about the legitimacy of polling locations, the board should take a preliminary vote tonight to say that this is where we think these polling locations should be. And then using the data that we gathered for the purposes of both precincting and just other common sense data. I believe the clerk and I were talking about this earlier. I hope I'm not reiterating a point that she already made, but you know, we have 11 polling locations in five and a half square miles. Um, we're required, <laughs> in theory, we could have only one. In theory, we could also have polling locations outside the boundaries of, of Arlington. So I think that there's a lot of sort of prima facie evidence that we basically satisfy these tests, but I think the board should take its vote tonight and that we should submit a report um, in an abundance of uh, respect for the secretary's interpretation of the special act uh, and make sure that there's no you know, uncertainty or clouds hanging over our polling locations. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Attorney Hahn. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to add anything further before I, um, okay, good. All right, thank you. And I wanna thank you, both both you and Attorney Heim. If we, we had some conversations in the past week and there has been a fair amount of dialogue with the elections division. And, and we thought it, at least at a minimum, whether we call it a preliminary vote or a contingent vote tonight, it was important for us to designate the, the polling locations that, that uh, we would like to put in place beginning with the uh, annual town election. And then there may be some further follow-up, as you mentioned, that we have to come back to have a confirmatory vote afterwards after some of the research is done. Um, but I wanted to turn it over to board members um, for, for comment, discussion, and, and then the ultimate vote. And uh, I'll start with Mr. Hurd. I didn't want to start on this one. <laughs> no. um, so if we look, are you looking for a motion right now or just discussion? If, if you'd like to have discussion first and then we could, we can go to a vote, that's fine too. Um, if, if there's any particular concerns you have, we- Or, we or a particular vote. polling. I sure. Mean, yeah, assuming you don't want me to go down to 21. Fine. Fine. <laughs> I mean, I, I think we've seen a, a good amount of, and I appreciate all the work that the clerk and staff has done um, on trying to identify for us locations that make sense with the current precinct map. And I think a lot of locations do make sense. Um, my thoughts, there, there was a proposal about Arlington High School, which I, I mean, certainly could work, um, but I, I think some uncertainties make that 
kind of not an ideal location for the precincts that are being proposed there. And you know, there's been a lot of discussion about precinct 10 or a lot of correspondence that we received about precinct 10. And, and the vast majority of it has been individuals that want to remain at town hall. And I, I think it's good, it's a noble cause to try to spread out some of the resources to make sure that we're not overloading any locations. But I do think town hall can, can handle a certain, if it ends up that, you know, we put a few more precincts in town hall, then we need to, that that location should be able to handle that. Um, so I would lean towards leaving precinct 10 at, at, at town hall. But I don't know what further comment you're looking for, Mr. Chair, if that's just kind of general thought to, as to what we've seen. Yeah, I, I, I think maybe just the way this is, is going to go, maybe what we do is get comments from members in terms of particular concerns they may have or, or issues. And, and if you want to comment, the other, the other suggestion, you mentioned the high school, the other um, suggestion that had come up is, is the Gibbs School. I don't know if you have any. Yeah. On, I, on, I, I think, I think the Gibbs, the Gibbs School is a great location for the suggested precincts. And we've had some correspondence in favor of that, where I think now that that's under the town's control and, and we have a newly renovated building that should certainly be one of the locations that we consider. So I think that the Gibbs School is definitely a good location and I'm on board with putting the close by um, precincts at Gibbs. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, Mr. Diggins. Well, I was expecting, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I was expecting the, 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 the clerk to like give us a, a recommended um, um, set of um, polling locations. He, uh, he, I, uh, me, I haven't even, I have the spreadsheet me, that I had um, kind of discussed with, with the, the clerk. He, uh, and, and so me, if you have that handy, Ms. Brazil, me, could you pull it up? Um, Otherwise, I can I can ask you to um, take someone else, Mr. Chair, and and I'll pull it up. I'll tell you sharing. I mean, um, on my screen could be a little bit of an issue. Okay. So All right. And this is the recommendation that you're referring to from the Election Modernization Committee that we had at our meeting on the twenty fourth. Well, it's kind of based on it's based on that, and then it's based on some input that we got from from residents. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, it certainly used the uh, um, the Gibbs School. Um, it kept six at Hardy. Uh, it kept eight and ten at at town hall. It brought nine over to town hall. It kept seventeen at Pierce. It took five and five and seven. And so it, it took five from from Thompson and put it over at Gibbs. And uh, and and everything else remained the same. <laughs> so so I think I recalled it correctly. You uh, know. Uh, so so in my discussion with the clerk, I mean, we were kind of leaning towards that one. You know, I mean, I had initially advocated for taking nine, putting nine and seven at Gibbs and keeping five at Thompson. But I think the clerk made a good case I mean, for taking nine over to the high school and, and we would then keep eight and 10 in at, um, at, I'm sorry, take, take nine over to town hall. I'm going to probably say high school. When I say high school, I mean town hall. Please forgive me. You know, uh, uh, and eight and 10 I mean um, at, at town hall. You know, so, so okay. I like that one. You know, I, I and so I was expecting the town clerk to present that one or or the one with the high school. And so, so was that clear, folks? Yeah, Miss Brazil, do you have that sheet that just lays out? Because maybe that's the the best way to go. We can comment on any particular concern sure. of what we agree with on on that sheet. Um, on yeah, so schedule. Yeah, I can, I can, I can do that. If I mean, one of the issues is it's now eight different presentations. That's the four we talked about um, before, uh, plus the two uh, suggestions from residents that I threw in, um, and then and then two uh, scenarios that uh, Mr. Diggins uh, provided. But if it's helpful um, to to put it up there, um, I'm happy to do that. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's helpful to have eight different versions, but it, it, <laughs> um, 
what I what I'd almost like to do just for the board's benefit is is maybe if, even if we went back and talked about change, I'd just like to see something that that lays out what we have right now and and maybe the eight schedules is is the best way to do it just just for sure. to help the discussion here in terms of where we go because I think we're going to come down to four or five locations that we really need to focus in on and um, yeah. So the current is um, is here. Right. Okay. And good. then, um, and then you know, and that's a question of, um, you know, if we're not using the high school, then you know that changes that changes things. So basically, you know, a lot of it boils down to, um, you know, do you want to use the high school? Um, which precincts go into the Gibbs? Do you, uh, you know, and that's just sort of that's the part where it's it's really up to the board to right. determine, um, you know, how many polling locations at once. There are a bunch of scenarios that end up leaving us with one precinct in the location, which isn't as efficient, you know. So, um, you know, it's difficult. It, you know, it, right. There are a lot of variables. This so. has the, the 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 where we are now, Mr. Diggins. Maybe if I could suggest this, Mr. Hurd had made comments on the high school and on Gibbs. And I think you have um, talked about Gibbs, supporting Gibbs. Maybe you could, if you have any issues with the high school or whether you support having locations there and we can try to frame the discussion that way. And I'll try to pull it together once once every member talks. I'm sorry, I, I didn't, I, I, I got confused when you mentioned the high school part because the one I was favoring was the one with Gibbs, not the high school. Okay, so so that now, uh, what I was asking for you is what your position was on the high school. So if you don't favor having any polling locations at the high school, that will be a second member now who would prefer not to have something at the high school, at least for this year. Yeah, sorry about that. It's a little noisy. Ian. So I heard you. I just didn't want you to be interrupted by the sounds. Yes, I mean, I'm very much in favor I mean, of, of, of Gibbs and not using the high school. And, okay. uh, and yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, keep it eight and ten at 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 um at town hall. Okay. All right. And and I, I believe you said nine at town hall as well. Nine at town hall as well. I mean, and 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 closing bishop. You know, I, mean, I forget where it goes. Um, um, it, right, on one of the renditions, it goes to Stratton. So, um, yeah. all right. So why don't why don't we? I'll hear from every member, and then we'll try to pull it together as I as I said. Um, and I'll turn to. Um, Mr. Helmut. Thank you. Yeah, so I think I definitely favor the Gibbs. I think there's sounds like there's some consensus on that. Uh, I also think there's been a good case to be made for moving to nine to town hall. So I like eight, nine, and ten at town hall. Um, I think with the high school, I don't mind using the high school. I think the superintendent thinks that that's feasible. I know that uh, I talked to one school board member and they pointed out. You know, that we vaccinated 1,200 students in one day, plus a parent, so 2,400 people went through in one day. Um, they managed signage and the construction fine, um, but but I don't know what the accessibility situation is there, and I think that's something that you know we'd have to look very very closely at. Um, but you know, I think I think some of my colleagues here in the board are more familiar with the high school layout and plan than I am. So, you know, if you, I, I gladly cede to that wisdom um, there. I, I do think, you know, I like long-term after this year, after more of the high school is completed, I really like the idea of a high school as a location. I think that that solves a couple of problems that we have with, um, with locations now. So I'd like to really look at that. And, you know, I don't, I don't mind looking at this year as a bit of a transition, particularly if we think that the high school is kind of a goal, you know, and you know, maybe we don't have a perfect solution this coming year. I also don't mind some inefficiency in that regard. You know, we don't want to be profligate with our expenses, but I think it's more important um, to make it easy for people to vote. Um, it's not, you know, it's, it's not hundreds of thousands of dollars of difference. Um, so, you know, I would lean towards finding a, a workable solution, even if we think of it as something. Um, short term here. And, um, you know, I think there are some problems to be solved at Bishop and Pierce. Um, 
I don't have strong feelings about those. I think my one question I would offer is like, do we need to solve this this year or do we look at it? Um, do we look at taking a whack at that next year when, uh, when we may have more, a, a clearer consensus from this body to use the high school? So those are just some questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Okay, I'm hearing the consensus, which, which I agree with. Um, Five and seven at Gibbs, making one and three at Thompson, two, four, six at Hardy, seven, eight, eight, I'm sorry, eight, nine, ten at, at the town hall. Um, everything else remains the same for now. I don't think we should even look at the high school for at least two years. I'd like to see 17 go there. Um, I'm not 100% sold on also adding 14, I think just 17, um, but that's not even on the table tonight, for tonight because. Um, you know, maybe two, three years down the road when the high school is finalized. And um, so that's where I'm at, which I think is where I think I'm hearing consensus on. And I understand that the town clerk will now take this and do her due diligence. And um, it's not the final vote tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Th th thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And, and thank you for running down the list. I have a list here in front of me and I, and I think that captures it. A couple of comments. I. I agree for two, four, and six that that should remain at Hardy. I like five and seven at the Gibbs. Um, I think two, four, and six works well. I agree on eight through 10. Seems like there's consensus on that. I think at some point in the future, just as other members have said, the high school may be appropriate, but it's just too early to be talking about that while it's under construction and, and some of the unknowns and, and some of the demands, frankly, on the Red Gym right now during the spring. Um, I, so I mentioned 10, mentioned nine at Town Hall, 12 and 14 at Brackett, 13 and 15 at Stratton. One issue, and I think it's um, an issue because I've heard two different things from members. I personally would be in favor of keeping precinct 11 at Bishop for this year because there's a lot of change in the precincts. I do think it makes sense to have only one precinct there. I spoke with Mrs. Kropelka earlier today about this issue and more than one precinct at Bishop has been a problem historically. So again, for this year, given the change that we're already making in the number of precincts and, and the, the way things have been reconfigured, I think if we can provide some certainty to precinct 11 at Bishop, that makes sense to me. And I think for precinct 17, again, for consistency, putting it at Pierce, I know the parking isn't ideal up there, but for this year, 17, 19, and 21, um, at Pierce seems to make the most sense for me. So um, unless there's any questions on, you know, there was some discussion on Gibbs, um, whether another precinct would be included there or not, but um, I see Mr. Hurd's hand up. So I'll, I'll go back to him um, for any, any further comments, but I think we're narrowing in on, on reaching a consensus here. Yeah, I'll just take a second crack at that now that I have the, uh, I'm not flying blind. Um, so I, in addition to what I had said before, I, I think was what I said about town hall comports with what most of the members have said. And as far as Bishop, we'd had some correspondence from um, members of, of precinct nine, which includes some elderly buildings that the Bishop school would just be overly burdensome for them to get to the school. So I agree that town hall is a location is the appropriate location for precinct nine and then like i agree with what the chair just mentioned that at least for this year um why not at least utilize the bishop school so if we can put one precinct in bishop i think that makes sense thank you mr chair okay thank you mr does anybody else have any comments because i'm going to read down a list here but uh, mr diggins did you want to say something yeah, I mean, I guess we, my only concern about Bishop is that I think, you know, I know that the number of election workers is really based more on the number of precincts, you know, but, but he, I, I think we're going to have some challenges um, getting election workers. So I think everybody that we can um, not have to get um, uh, the better. And that is not really, please, please, me, I'm not trying to minimize the number of, of locations for money is really just a matter of staffing. So 
but but I hear you. So so it's it's not there's no upset if we keep Bishop open. It's just a, another little thing to take into account. Um, I'm I'm more than happy to go along with what I think is is um the consensus. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Heller. Thank you. Just a quick question. So under, I think I liked what I was hearing the chair uh, lay out, but um, where was precinct five again in that, in your suggestion? At, at Gibbs. Okay. Yeah. I, I like that too. Um, and and I, I would concur that, um, you know, I like none of us know that none of us think that Bishop is ideal, but I think, I think the chair's point of kind of minimizing, minimizing uh, disruption right now um, would, would be a helpful thing. And, you know, I think we're all it seem to be consensus that we're looking kind of a realignment once we have other resource of the high school. So I'd, I'd be comfortable with that. Okay, thank, thank you, Ms. Talmud. So I'm, I'm gonna read, um, Ms. Brazil, did you wanna say something in response to? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that the board, um, I forwarded all of the comments I got. There were, um, there was a, a comment from uh, uh, precinct five indicating that um, some people in precinct five were concerned that there was more, there was not enough parking at the Gibbs. There was more parking at the Thompson. So, you know, I mean, it is, it is um, possible to not change five um, and just add seven to the Gibbs. Um, uh, you know, I mean, you know, we could, we could try it um, for the town election and see how people liked it. Their parking's not an issue on a Saturday. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, it's, I just wanted to, I just wanted to toss that out there as, as just one thought. Um, uh, I agree seven, you know, seven is very well served at the Gibbs. After that, it's really a question of uh, what the board thinks makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I thank, thank, thank you for those comments. I, I had actually received some comments from people in Precinct Five who, who like Gibbs. So I, so I, I um, so let, let me do this. Let me read down this list, okay? And if we have a consensus, I'll ask for, for a motion. I think we do. Um, so what we have, and I'll go right down the order: one and three at Thompson, two, four, and six at Hardy, five and seven at Gibbs, eight, nine, and ten at Town Hall, eleven at Bishop. 12 and 14 at Brackett, 13 and 15 at Stratton, 16, 18 and 20 at Dallin, and 17, 19 and 21 at Pierce. Okay, if that's what the board is comfortable with, I'd ask for a motion on that or any further comment if there's any further discussion that people wanna have. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay, um, any further comments from Mr. Hurd or Mr. Helmick? Um, seeing none. Okay, so on a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins, uh, Attorney Hine. Heard? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? With thanks to the chair for pulling that together? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Brazil. And we'll, we'll be back for the confirmatory vote and we'll, we will coordinate with you before then. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, now moving to the consent agenda, items six, seven, and eight. Item six, minutes of meetings, January 10th, 2022, and January 24th, 2022. Item seven, for approval, open reads together banners. Uh, item eight, acceptance of funds received from various entities. Uh, on the consent agenda, uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I motion to approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Um, Mr. Helmuth? Second, thank you. Mrs. Mahan? No questions, thank you. Mr. Hurd? No questions, thank you. Okay. And, and just uh, one quick thing, and I believe we mentioned it to Ms. Marr, there's just one small administrative change on the 24th on the subcommittee for the signs. It's Mr. Hurd and Mr. Diggins, but that, that will be reflected in, in the actual minutes. So if the, if the vote is to, um, to that effect, um, we, we're good to go. If you don't mind that, Mr. Diggins, as a, as a slight amendment on those minutes. That's fine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's fine. Okay. All right. Um, so on a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 
Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Thank you. Um, item nine for approval, Arlington Education Foundation 5K race on May 15th, 2022. Laura Fuller from the Arlington Education Foundation. Uh, is Ms. Fuller with us this evening? Yes, she is, Mr. Chair. I just promoted her to panelist. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, I'm here. Great. Um, yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, the race and, and um, the approval that you're seeking for that date? Certainly. Um, I would also like to note that I have uh, online today uh, Judy Geyer, who is the president of the Arlington Education Foundation, and Siobhan Hanley, who is also working with me on organizing the race. Um, for any questions that you have, um, I think you are all familiar with the Arlington Education Foundation. We are an Arlington nonprofit, um, and we work to support and advance um, public education here in Arlington. Um, we, as an organization, we like to engage the Arlington community to share um, awareness of our work and also find creative ways to uh, fundraise. Um, unfortunately, because of the pandemic over the last two years, we've been unable to hold our traditional events, which in the fall is a, um, a grant showcase where we bring in all the grants we've awarded or a good number of the grants we've awarded in the past year. Um, and we invite community members to come and celebrate those and learn more about what we are, uh, the innovation that's happening in our school. And then in the spring, and I think many of you are involved in this, is our annual Trivia Bee, which we hold at Town Hall. And that's a really just a fun event to um, bring community members together um, and to share some of the wisdom that um, our fifth graders know and then also our the adults in our community. So, uh, at, we've been we've been moving forward um, as we can during the pandemic, and uh, we've been seeking other outdoor opportunities uh, to bring the community together uh, during these times. Um, I think, uh, it, for example, in October, we um, quickly put together an event to welcome uh, Dr. Liz Homan uh, to Arlington, um, and that was just a wonderful event in the town hall garden. So we appreciate. Uh, being able to do that. Um, but as we're seeking another opportunity, um, we became aware that other education foundations in neighboring towns have actually used 5K events to bring community together and to create awareness of their organization. Um, and so we have been looking at this and talking to other race organizers, excuse me, other race organizers in the area. Um, for this event, which we are proposing on May 15th, um, which is a Sunday morning in the spring, um, we propose to start at about 8 a.m. We are planning to partner with Arlington Community Education, which um, coordinates through their after school programs, um, several running clubs for children in town here in our public schools. So for example, the Fit Girls program, which is for fourth and fifth graders across most elementary schools, um, Boys in Motions for, for boys uh, in the elementary schools, and then there are running clubs um, across Gibbs and the Audison. Um, and there are actually running clubs at the high school as well. So we are hoping to work with them for volunteers for this event. Um, and our plan is, um, so many of those programs, those kids work toward, to building up the endurance to run a 5K. And then at the end of the program, they all sign up together and run the 5K together. So it would just be really great to host that event in Arlington where you get all these Arlington kids, maybe their parents, maybe their teachers uh, running together here in town. Um, so our proposal is, again, as I said, a May 15th race, which is a Sunday morning, hopefully starting at 8 a.m. Um, and we have been working with Joe Conley at the Recreation Department and the Rink uh, to set that up to begin and end at Hills Hill Field, which is right there in the Ed Burns Arena complex. Um, our plan is um, to hopefully have about uh, a maximum of 600 participants, we believe, um, with full participation of all those running programs, about half of that, um, those participants will come from those running programs and affiliates of those running programs, and then that would open it up for another 300 participants from our community, hopefully. Um, and the route, as I said, is going to start and end on Hills Hill Field. Our plan is to use the 
bike path, the uh, Minuteman Bikeway, um, to start the race, head east on the bike path all the way to Water Street, take a quick jog from Water Street uh, to Mass Ave, and then head west all the way to Lowell Street, which gets you uh, to the bike path via Fraser Street. And ideally we would uh, propose that we close the bike path for this race. Um, we did learn from uh, Mr. Conley that uh, the town day race that was held actually in 2021 without town day, um, they did get some uh, traffic from bikers interfering with runners and, and that made it difficult. So he advised if we could to close the bike path, if not, our backup plan is actually to um, create some signage, get it out there a couple of weeks in advance, and then to use any public notices in town here to uh, make the public aware that there will be a race that will be held on the bike path on that Sunday morning. Um, and hopefully if it starts at eight, it will be completed by 930. And hopefully at that point, most of the traffic will be missed. Um, and, um, and our to follow up as well, um, we plan to follow all CDC guidelines in our conversations with the Board of Health. They are um, happy with us having an outdoor event, um, but I think you know, following CDC guidelines as they evolve in May um, is our plan to, to um, do that. And that in, in involves just keeping um, what we're offering to participants to water, and then we are proposing just offering um, some sort of food because there's so many kids um, participating in the race. So perhaps like a granola bar or something that one of our sponsors can supply. Um, and then we're finally, we're gonna engage with a, following uh, approval by the board. Uh, we will engage further with the police department. We have talked to them briefly about this um, and they are on board giving your approval um, just to ensure that we have proper details at road crossings and uh, for the safety of all participants. And if anybody has any questions, I, we are happy to answer them. Great. Thank, thank you, Ms. Fuller. I'll turn to the board now. Um, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to move approval. Um, this is happening on this date. Hopefully all sunshine, with maybe a little bit of clouds, um, but I see there's no rain date. So that's it. This is one of my questions. And I think definitely um, once, uh, if this board approves it, um, speaking with um, Officer Rateau and others with the police department, um, as well as maybe Attorney Hine, if the town actually can close um, the Minuteman Trail. Um, if not, either way, if we can or cannot do that, definitely signage getting up at least the week before, um, just to uh, let people know. And I think you know, having done town day for so many years, it really will give the event organizers as well as our into police department a little more. Um, if we can't close off the Minuteman Trail, the signage has gone up. Um, it kind of helps with the 1% of, of people, persons that are just gonna wanna argue the points that um, if we can say, this has been up for a week, you know about it. So, um, and I do appreciate Ms. Fuller and Ms. Geyer, um, you know, my roots started in PTO and um, didn't have anything like COVID, no pandemic and barely an endemic um, back then. And uh, what you all have done to, you know, continue on uh, fundraising and more importantly, get the message out and the tie in between our children and our um, adults uh, here in Arlington, um, I'm very appreciative of. So um, God bless you and I'll pray for good weather and um, let us know what else the board can do to help. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Happy to support the motion. I always look forward to the 5Ks in town. And I think it's, we've had a, a few over the years, some that are on an annual basis and some one-offs that come into town for various reasons. So I think it's a, it's a fun event for everyone that's involved and it's a good safe event to, to conduct right now. Um, I am on a little bit of a health and wellness kick, so you, maybe I'll I'll suit up for the race. We'll see where I am in a few months. Um, but again, uh, you guys do so much for the town of Arlington and the kids. I have kids in the schools, so I certainly appreciate that. I met I mentioned I I do miss the trivia B. In March 2020, myself, the chair, and our former colleague Mr. Curl 
had an all-star team that was locked and ready to go for the trivia B that was supposed to be at the end of March and that, that never was. So we'll look forward to when we can have it again and, and see who we can put together from the board at that time. So again, happy to support it and thank you for all your work. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, we, we were well prepared. I, uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, so, um, so the folks um, who use the bike pass, I mean, what alternative do they have when it's closed? Um, Mr. Chapel, I mean, streets, right? I, I, I think it's, you know, they, they may have to go to Mass Ave or, or um, look, look for, depending where they're, where they're getting off. This would, this would start right at the rink there, right at, um, right next to the rink. So from there down to Mill Street, that, that, that would be the detour. Yeah. So it would be it would be about a mile and a half of the bike path. It would go from um, Fraser Street, which is um, right near Lowell Street, um, all the way to Water Street. Okay. So yes, we would suggest that they use Mass Ave okay. around there or Summer Street. Gotcha. So um, and this is um to um, I think um to town council. So what is potentially the barrier um to closing the bike path? I'll have to look at this a little bit more closely, Mr. Diggins. Um, I appreciate Ms. Mahan's concern. The bike path is um, basically given to Arlington to run by agreement by the MBTA. I, I presume, but I'm not 100% positive that we can close it for limited periods of time for an event, but I, I'd have to look into it. I, I, I frankly don't know the answer off the top of my head and I wouldn't want to mislead anybody. Uh, again, it, it's, it's Arlington's to essentially operate uh, by agreement with the MBTA. And, um, you know, I, I don't off the top of my head believe it's that different than a street closure for an event or purpose uh, for some other, you know, reason, a parade or something like that. So I, I think it's fine, but I'll, I'll double check and make sure. Right, right. All right. I appreciate it. So I, mean, I definitely think it's safer to close the bike pass, I mean, but I. <laughs> I guess it's just my my uh, my prejudice. I have an easier time closing a street to cars I mean, than I do closing the bike paths, you know, to the cyclists and, and pedestrians. I guess because I guess take out the I guess my concern is that we we put the the cyclists mean in more jeopardy, I mean uh, by shifting them onto the streets, I mean than than we do by just having the cars avert onto another street. And I'm not concerned so much about a slippery slope where, you know, everyone will come asking us for this, me, but, but it's just my kind of hesitancy to um, just kind of go, okay, well, let's close the bike pass and, and, and have the race, me, but, but it's a good cause, me, and, um, and I just had to state that, that, that overall concern, me, and so now you've heard it, and I'm happy to move on and vote for it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. I, I just want to clarify something. It's actually not Mill Street, it's Water Street. It's a little further down and then coming back Fraser Street is a little bit the just at the uh, where Lowell Street splits from Mass Ave that that's the side street there so um, thank you for your comments and uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Um, thanks to the AEF folks I enjoyed uh, being able to go to this past summer's event by uh, welcoming Dr. Holman. Uh, it was really well done. It was a great event and uh, you know it's good to see you uh, see you out there. Just a, a question for you, looking at the permit, um, you mentioned closing the bikeway, your proposal to for a couple of different, different timeframes. One, in one place it says uh, 8.30, 10 a.m. and 1.30, uh, one was 7.30 to nine. Um, did you, do you have a, a sense for which one of those you are landing on right now? 7.30 to nine is more appropriate at this point. Um, we uh, and the history of that is that we originally suggested 9 a.m. as the race start, and then we were given the advice that we should go earlier, um, just so it doesn't conflict with uh, church services and uh, the population getting out there to, to, to exercise. And and um, so we uh, so we did move the race to eight. So we are are suggest we are proposing for the race to begin at eight o'clock. So we would like the bike path to to be closed from 7.30 to nine, um, hopefully, I would say nine or 9.30 at this point. Okay. Um, thank you. And 
Will you talk, and I apologize if you address this in this, are you, is this a staggered start or is this kind of an all at once? Um, currently we are thinking all at once and I think that will depend on the uh, number of registrants and the CDC guidelines at the time. Okay. Um, so the big concern is leaving Hills Hill Field and getting onto the bike path. Right. Um, that there might be a bottleneck there. And if that is the case, I, I think what we would do is start the kids race, offer all the kids running for uh, all the programs would start earlier. And then after a 10 minute delay, we would start everybody else. Okay, all right, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. so, so to my colleagues, um, actually I actually have some real reservations about closing the bike path. And, and I don't, I think just because, I mean, I'm, I'm open to the wisdom, greater wisdom of my colleagues, but I think we should be, aware, you know, that's the Minuteman commuter bikeway. It's not just a recreational resource. There are people who rely on it for transit um, and plan on having it available. Um, now that's a good time of day. I think I'm, I'm happier with the earlier time frame of that. Um, and I understand, you know, we have, to, I understand there are safety concerns and I, and I care about those. Um, I don't know if a solution can be made to keep the bike path open, but to somehow restrict a lane of that for the road race, for instance. Um, but my question, I guess, is to maybe to, and I'm not sure who this is to, Mr. Chair, you can direct it. Um, is the closure of the bike path something that the select board would, would determine in this vote, or are we approving the larger uh, permit and you know, the town manager essentially would, would direct that, that decision finally? Well, I, I may ask uh, Attorney Hyman that my, my understanding is that would be part of our vote, that that that, that the would close for part of that time. But I think, believe Mrs. Mahan said in her comments, work with the police department. And if there are issues that come up, there yeah. may be, have to be a sharing of the of the of the bikeway. It's not I, ideal, but I think I think this is a approval understands that there may be more dialogue with the police department and, and perhaps with Attorney Hyman researching the extent of, of, of our authority there too, but that we'd like to see this go forward if there are serious reservations after further discussion with Officer Rateau or, or if Attorney Hine finds anything, um, it may have to be more of a shared experience on the bikeway. Yeah, sure. Did, Hi -Hine, did you want to add anything to that or? I just, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, our, as you may recall, we set the hours for when the bikeway is allowed to be opened. Um, so I, 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 I do think that, that, that you can improve, um, subject to conditions, but if the board is not inclined to close the bike path, I think just on its own merits, it can certainly make that decision. Mm -hmm. Uh, or you, you basically have to modify the proposal that's in front of you, uh, in order to approve the proposal, but not approve that. So in my mind, the board should be voting on, does it want to basically grant the permit subject to confirmation that the bikeway can be closed or it should be uh, approving it, um, you know, with the idea that there will be some concrete alternate plan that's required in order to gain approval. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's helpful. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think Mr. Chaplain had his hand up. You want to? Yes, Mr. Chaplain, did you yeah, want to? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interject. I just I thought this might be a good time. I, I, I'm happy to further coordinate with the police department and any other appropriate departments. And I, and I would add, and I, and I think a number of people on the screen have probably done the same. I've run a number of the Council on Aging Arlington for All Ages road races, which uses a portion of the bike path down in East Arlington over the years, and it's never been closed and has operated without incident as far as I'm aware. So I, I think it's doable. Um, you know, there is more width on the sides of the bike path in East Arlington than there is in the Heights, but I don't think it's an entirely different construct. So I, I think, I don't wanna dismiss what Joe Connolly said about there being some yeah. uh, conflicts uh, with the, the, the Moynihan race, but I, I think based on past precedent, it is something we can work through. Th thank you. Um, I think Mr. Diggins struck struck the note that, that really does doesn't have any kind of concern, and that is, I mean, safety for the race matters. This is a great race. I want to support it. Um, but shuttling people who are who who may need to use the bike path for for commuting purposes um, onto the streets, given especially this is the long closure 
of the bike path. Um, that concerns me. I, I'm not sure I want to. I want to support that. Um, but I'll, you know, I'll see how, how my colleagues want to do. I think I might offer an amendment to Mrs. Mahan's motion that we would approve uh, with the modification of of not closing the bikeway but finding an acceptable solution. But you know, that'll be up to Ms. Mahan if that's an acceptable amendment. Or you know, Mr. Chair, you can figure out how to how to handle that. Um, certainly, want to respect my colleagues' uh, preference. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Before I'd like to, have, Mr. Hurd had his hand up, so I'd like to ask him if he wants to add anything to the discussion here and then we can talk about a potential amendment yep um so i say one thing i a couple of years ago ran the somerville road race the somerville homeless coalition road race and that used a portion of the bike path that did when we did that it we lived down mass ave and we just came one way down the bike path and i'm not aware that it was closed and it was fine in that once everyone starts together but very few people run at the same pace so you sort of over a 5k you sort of spread out but i mean again you know we can look at the safety concerns and leave it to the police department to review the safety concerns i mean i would i don't want to discount that nobody can commute on a sunday but i mean this is a sunday morning so i think the vast majority of the people using that are going to be recreational users and I think the concern with kids, the Somerville Road Race was mostly adults, but we have kids, is that, you know, 97% of the people that the cyclists on the bike path use it in a safe and, you know, prudent way. I think the concern is the 3% that come down at 40 miles an hour and don't really want to slow down for anybody on the bike path. And, you know, I've been on the bike path just on normal days with the kids where I, I think to myself, it's not really a good place for kids to be just because there's people that aren't really concerned about the wayward paths that kids take sometimes as, as they move about the universe. So, I mean, I think if there's a way that we can leave it for further investigation, that's fine. But I mean, I don't think it's overly onerous to ask some recreational cyclists to, that for a couple hours to, you know, maybe drive down to Lexington and use that portion of the bike path or so, I mean, those are my thoughts. Okay, th th thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, Mr. Helmut, did you wanna offer an amendment? Uh, I don't think I will. Okay. I think Mr. Hurd makes, makes a decent point. And, 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 I, and I will say, and, and, and think, I, I do think Mrs. Mahan's motion will capture that if, if, if it can't be done and it has to be some short, sort of shared use after consultation with the police and, and why don't we include the town manager in that as, as well, then, then um, I, I think Ms. Fuller and Ms. Geyer, if that's acceptable, we may have to adjust as, as further research is done, but we want to at least give you the the permit and then talk about the scope of the the bikeway use at, as as is further consultation okay all right okay all right so on a motion by mrs mahan that is seconded by mr hurd um attorney Hein. mr hurd yes mr diggins yes mr helmet yes mrs mahan yes mr corsi yes it's unanimous vote thank you both Thank you for your time. Uh, item 10 for approval, Arlington Public Art Youth Banner Initiative on Massachusetts Avenue and Arlington Center from April 1, 2022 through May 31, 2022. Sarah Gurney, Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture. Ms. Gurney, I believe she's here with us this evening. Good evening, Ms. Gurney. Hi, I'm Sarah Gurney. I'm the new Youth Banner Coordinator, and um, we uh, would like to propose to um, permit to install um, 22 banners this year on 11 light poles in April and May. And I, I submitted a presentation. I don't know if I can share it here. Um, I'm going to try to do that. Uh, 
Um, can you see that okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to go through the slideshow. This is all of the work that has been selected for the banners. The theme this year is color. And we had over 100 applicants and we selected 20 and three of those will be getting scholarships too. Uh, we had six art jurors in December. We had um, Mr. Hel Helmuth and uh, was one of the jurors and we had police chief Flaherty and three art teachers and a local artist. And, and the period here is April 1 through May 31 on the request, is that correct? I believe so, yes. Right. Um, while we we're showing this, maybe I, it, unless you want to add anything, I, I may turn to the board for, for any well, comments yeah. and a motion. Okay, and I'll start Great. with our juror. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I'm glad we're I'm glad we're seeing those. This was this was a real pleasure. I appreciate being included. It was a, a joy to do this with Chief Flaherty and and the art teachers who are outstanding. These students showed just a high level of talent uh, all the way from the middle school up to the high school. Uh, it was really tough. We had a lot of high quality um, submissions, and I will be really proud to see these um, on our flight poles. So thank you. In, in, I do. Do you want to make a motion on it? Mr. Oh Mayor? yes. Yeah. In fact, I do. I would like to move approval. <laughs> Thank okay. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Mahan. Second. Thank you. No questions. Okay, Mr. Hurd. Happy to support this. It went through the artwork. You know, there is some beautiful artwork that I think will really enhance the visibility of Mass Ave. Um, I love this. The theme this year is very appropriate for a student art contest, which is color, which leads to some really interesting work, which I look forward to. I want to thank Mr. Helmuth for, for serving on the uh, juror committee and give a shout out to Ms. Greenland, the much beloved Dallin art teacher as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, the, the, the art is really right up my alley. I mean, uh, I love that abstract impressionistic in kind of art in, uh, and, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to participate but I think that day I had like three meetings in, uh, uh, and so I just couldn't couldn't do it uh, so a couple of questions you know one um, to um, Ms. Um, I'm sorry Ms. Gurney uh, um, um, is it possible for us to see the other um, artwork online or something oh everything that was submitted yes uh, we we gave everything back I think okay. except for what was selected. The answer is no, that's fine. Um, uh, uh, and the second is that you, know, you have two months, you know, which is a, a pretty long amount of time you know, to, to, um, to, to have the polls, which is fine. You know, but I was just thinking maybe next year if um, we you know, do two months again, I mean, maybe we could have like more art, you know, like one month for one set of panels and another month for another set of panels. You know, so just put it out there as an idea. You know, so, but happy to support this. Thank you. Yeah, there were some great, really great applicants. Um, and I can I add one one um, detail is the reason we want an extra light pole this year is we're going to be adding two banners, um, one at each end with signage. That was the last slide that was shown there. Um, it was designed by Adria Arch. And um, usually, I guess they've done the text on the actual artwork. So this year, we, we thought it was best to separate that signage. Thank you. Any, anything further, Mr. Diggins? No, I'm, not, I'm fine, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, great. And yeah, and I'm happy to support this as well. And, and I want to thank you for bringing this forward to us and thank Mr. Helmuth for his participation and it uh, looks like excellent choices as, as part of the overall group. So on a, a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Hyde. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Great. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, it's 9.15 now. Before I move on to open forum, would members like a five-minute break? We'll take a break now, come back at 9.20? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Well, welcome back. Uh, next on the agenda is open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board 
shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. Um, Mr. Chapelain, I'd ask if there are any, anyone who wishes to be heard uh, for open forum. Right now there is one hand raised, Carl Wagner. Good evening, Mr. Wagner. Can you hear me? Okay? Uh, having a little bit of trouble. Okay? Uh, having a little bit of trouble. Let me go a little closer. Is that any better? Yes. Let me see if I can adjust the uh, audio things to be automatic. Oh, it says automatically adjusted anyway. Um, I'll try to speak loudly. I, I just wanted to uh, reach out to the select board following my letter to this for the uh, Cutter Hill Road blasting that's planned for uh, February or March. Did any of you get a chance to see that or read that? I didn't see it on the list of, of materials selected for select board tonight from the public. And this is the first meeting, I believe, where you've had a chance to uh, receive materials like that. Well, the purpose of the of, of my letter to you and also to uh, a couple of the boards in Arlington was that uh, some private work is going to be done on a property that goes up between uh, Cutter Hill, just where the fish shop is at the end of Mill Street there. And if any of you have driven there, you'd be aware that Cutter Hill Road has a very strange bottleneck that's unusual to streets in Arlington. It's the private way, unfortunately. It, um, it's an opportunity while blasting is happening to perhaps make that bottleneck into a much safer thoroughfare. Currently, there's no way for pedestrians to walk no sidewalk. There's not even a second lane for two lanes of traffic. There's only one lane. And it's, uh, it's not the only place in Arlington like that, but it is a big safety hazard. And it's always been something that we as a town couldn't do anything about. Well, since the private owner of the property there is going to be blasting, perhaps you and the select board and the powers to be in the town could find a way to at least make maybe one sidewalk or enough space so that children and users of the road could be a little bit uh, safer, including driving vehicles to see each other better. So um, please take a look, if you can, uh, at the, where, the place where Summer Street and Mill Street end. There's a sort of semi-dirt road there at Cutter Hill Road, and uh, it really needs improvement. Um, I would also point out that there are a lot of trees in the tree canopy on that property. It's not currently developed at all. And I hope that uh, people will take a look at how many trees are there and find a way to work with the owner to save as many as possible and possibly to allow the owner to not save the ones right at the edge so pedestrian uh, uh, thoroughfares could be improved. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wagner, for your comments and for the, for the email that you sent us as well. Uh, any anybody else, Mr. Chapdelaine? No, there is not. Okay, uh, we're moving on. Uh, item 11, under traffic rules and orders and other business. Item 11, presentation, remote participation study committee, interim report. Mr. Helmuth is a member of that committee, but uh, okay. Do we have we do have someone from the yeah? Uh, Mustafa should be joining us. Here he is. Hello. Um, is my audio coming through? Yes, it is. Good evening. Good evening. Um, well, thank you for giving us the time. Um, I have two other um, people that are probably online that may be um, helpful in answering any questions that come up. Uh, Vice Chair Jennifer Seuss and. Um, Alex Bagnall, who are on the uh, Remote Participation Study Committee. Um, I just wanted to let um, um, wish I could, yeah. um, let, let, uh, let you know before we get going. Um, so I'm here on behalf of the Remote Participation Study Committee. Um, this was a committee formed in the pre previous town meeting in 2022. And our remit was to study um, and, and understand the methods and ways of bringing the benefits of remote access that we've in some sense enjoyed in the pandemic um, one of the one of the benefits of the pandemic um, to have this these new ways of working and to um, see how they may um, be applicable after the pandemic is over 
and and see if they can be incorporated into um, hybrid meetings um, in the future. Hybrid meetings, just to, to find out front, being meetings where people are assembled in one place physically and other people join in remotely and in this new age with video and audio. So we have some slides, if you don't mind. Um, do you want me to put them up or um, can you put them up? What's the best way here? If you have, I, I believe you may have capabilities to share. Is that, I think that might be easier, Mr. Kiptolina. Yeah. Here we go. And is that showing up well? Uh, yes, it is. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll um, go through a short presentation. We, we understand we have about 10 minutes and um, see how busy your agenda is. So um, as I said, we've been, we were charged to um, understand and, and sort of how we may implement um, or may study how we may, um, the benefits and how to implement these types of meetings. So the article um, and also, excuse me, more specifically, um, as part of our remit, we are we we submitted a report to the select board that you received in your documents. Um, that's an interim report. Our, our we will have a much more comprehensive report um, presented detailing these charges here um, to the town meeting this year. And our commission, so to speak, goes until next year, the April 2023 town meeting. So this is the first interim report um, to show kind of share where we're headed and what we've learned. So briefly, we were charged with um, understanding the benefits and challenges of hybrid meetings. Um, it was sort of broken down, you know, which bodies would we want to um, provide? Would we propose that remote participation be a part of? Which portions of the meetings should be, um, can or should be available for these um, hybrid access, remote access? There was a remit um, to look at um, what local rules or any changes we may need to the current rules to um, for remote participation. Of course, the big one that everybody raises the cost and the, the technical feasibility of these with hybrid remote participation. And then, you know, one of the benefits of high, I mean, remote access in principle is accessibility enhancement to, to let more people in, but we want to look at that more rigorously than just the, what we all thought. And what was added as uh, sort of later on in the discussion was a way of understanding how public bodies provide information back to the public about um, their work. And so those are the seven charges um, that we were um, tasked with. We started on um, September 30. We were formed on September 30. So it's been a very quick autumn. Um, and we, um, we, what we did is we wanted to gather information before we started making any recommendations. So in this period, we've um, developed and um, conducted and analyzed and written two reports, which are in your meeting materials. We examined um, the town, we asked the opinions of the members of the town boards, committees and commissions. There are 64 of these. Mustafa, um, I, I'm, very, I'm, I'm sorry, Mustafa. I think that your slides are not um, advancing and you, you're probably doing it on year end. Can you give that a quick try? Because I know, I know it's in the deck. Oh, okay. Um, excuse me. Your screen sharing is paused. I don't know why my screen sharing is paused. Let me try this again. Thank you for telling me. Well, this, that? this illustrates one of the challenges of hybrid meetings. Yes. And in, um, <laughs> embarrassing and informatively, we have had our own challenges um, in our remote participation study committee remote meetings, um, as you may imagine. So um, are we on the information gathering what we did slide in your world? Okay, I see heads nodding. Yeah. So, so this is what I was speaking to. We conducted the two surveys. And as I mentioned, we did the, uh, the town meeting boards, commissions, and committees. And of the 64 bodies, we received responses from 60 of these. Um, and we received 144 individual responses. So we are obtaining you know, more than one person per committee giving us their feedback. Um, we didn't. Um, we, 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 we followed up a few times. We also wanted to hear what the people attending meetings, um, in general, these would be most recently remote participants, but also in-person participants. So we built a different survey for them and, um, and that received 354 responses. And in the next slide or two, I'll, I'll kind of go over what those were. We also had an interesting presentation by um, researcher Max Palmer, who works with Katie Einstein who, um, uh, especially uh, Katie and, um, and with Mox Palmer, 
they study a lot of uh, civic engagement issues. And one of the things that they um, saw um, from, their, um, from their studies is that, well, we all like to think that remote access may level the playing field for a broader um, spectrum of society and a more diverse set of people coming to meetings. What was interesting was that it, it in general, um, brought basically much the same um, demographic that comes to in-person meetings, which tends to um, skew towards um, homeowners, homeowners which sort of skews towards wealthier um, and more established um, residents of the town, as opposed to maybe younger renters um, and then more diverse um, populations. So that's something that was um, an interesting piece of information. What we took away from these surveys, and, and we didn't break it down by survey, we just broke it down what people saw as the benefits and concerns, because mostly both the boards and commissions that were the members of those um, that responded and the people that pub in the public that attend these meetings essentially saw the same things from, from either side of this um, divide, not divide, but you know, either side of the uh, table. Um, so a lot of people raise the fact that in meetings such as this, they can tune in for the part that they care about, um, you know, from the comfort of their home. They don't need to attend a meeting for three hours when they're concerned about 20 minutes of it. Um, and the board members said that that's also beneficial and that it gets people speaking to specific issues that they are concerned about. So it helps getting input into the boards. Um, so it was, it was um, positive from both sides. Um, it removes the physical space requirement or limitations in many ways. If the room is too small, um, you know, a lot more people can attend if they want to. There's sort of unlimited space in that sense. And this topic that's been raised a lot, um, it came in a lot of different flavors, but essentially it removes other obstacles to attending. Um, child care came up a lot, um, traveling and whether that people otherwise wouldn't travel for, for something, you know, as I said earlier, if they had a short period they cared about, they might not want to travel in, in certain situations. People that are actually traveling out of town but are interested in town business residents um, can attend. And of course, physical accessibility um, and, and disability constraints, um, th these would help overcome those. Um, I think there was actually more unity on the concerns. Um, and the top two really came out strong. The technical complexity, as you just saw, um, I'm fairly experienced at Zoom. And, I wasn't sharing my screen despite thinking I was sharing my screen. This came up, obviously audio came up, the quality of audio um, and people really want to not have those problems. Um, and then the other one more on a, um, let's say um, um, from a meeting management and, um, and style or um, perspective, people really want to have parity of experience and opportunity. So they, they're concerned that, you know, the remote folks won't be recognized the people in, in person may not be um, able to share their opinions as well. Um, and then they just wanted equity and parity in, in treatment. Um, and then on a practical manner, um, there's a thought that it's very challenging to manage um, a meeting and people coming in and out and the audio video and any challenges. So there really is um, some way of identifying either um, staff people that are present in meetings already or volunteers that may take this, um, this burden up within smaller boards and commissions to make this work. And then um, this one came up a few times, you know, people enjoy gathering and people enjoy meeting people with like-minded interests um, or people that they've seen at similar meetings and there is a real feeling that that would be lost with this remote participation aspect. So these were the, and again, the details of these and much more are in the, um, in the uh, survey reports that have been submitted to you. So, you know, our charge is to make rank, ranked recommendations. Um, and we've broken the recommendations into two, I, two um, broad sections, sort of on the policy side and on the implementation side. So on the policy side, um, the select board and the school committee, we, incur, we ask that the select board and school committee authorize, encourage and support hybrid participation in meetings um, and to just give a little bit of background, um, and it's actually, I just saw it at the end of this, it's, it's, again, it's an addendum or an attachment to your, this current select board meeting. The legislation currently authorizes remote access and remote quorum. 
um, in this format that we're all in. Um, when we weren't in a remote environment, the select board, I believe at some point has authorized remote access to in-person meetings. And in the old days, that was, you know, a telephone dial-in number. And that's something in the open meeting law, there needs to be explicit authorization by the executive body of the town, whether it's the mayor or the select board or, or whatever else it may be, to provide this authorization. Um, so that would be something when we return, when the state legislation that we are currently operating under is over, I would expect that we would continue as has been authorized in the past, but that is something in the select board's control. And so we'd ask for that authorization um, to continue. Uh, no, no change, but it's, it's a requirement. Beyond that authorization, we would really enjoy and, and, and hope to have the encouragement and support to um, conduct hybrid meetings after um, the legislation ends. This, um, this is more for our recommendation to ourselves, but we would like to um, develop guidelines for different hybrid participation models. There are a wide variety of meetings, uh, this format with a board at the front and people coming to it, formats where people sit around in a large table, small table, you know, small groups and so on. So we would like to um, build out some hybrid um, participation models to sort of address several broad swaths of meetings. And we'd also like to give some guidelines. And again, these are not rules or, or strict, you know, and certainly not laws, um, but just guidelines on how people should start to think about what will happen when you have technical failure and allow the boards and commissions to, um, to make their own choices. And then we would ask that the town um, commit to active outreach um, to raise awareness of meetings with a broader population. Um, and we're trying very hard to not put this on the DEI director explicitly. So we're looking and hoping to find other opportunities or options that can help do that. Um, that's, that's too easy an answer and that may just not be the best answer. It may overburden someone that's already busy. So on the implementation, um, we ask this, this comes to the to select board, um, to invest in location and technologies um, to pilot some hybrid meetings. And we selected these meetings um, based on the feedback from the, especially the public's um, survey results and from conversations with various members of these boards that they are willing to be the pilot for these, for this type of meeting. The, um, obviously the select board and school committee are already set up to run hybrid meetings. They have, um, you both, you and the school committee have rooms with the appropriate technology. So that's a somewhat easier lift. Um, it'll be more challenging for the other groups on this list. These were the highest ranked risk groups. And so we like to do that. To put this in perspective, currently the legislation ends at the beginning of April and um, we expect it to be expand, extended till July. There's some legislation going around. So these pilots wouldn't start until the legislation, until we end our current all remote access. And that's something we would work towards trying to help get rolling. We also, um, in terms of identifying locations suitable for hybrid meetings, the select board chambers um, with some improvements in technology are actually very well equipped. And for periods when the select board is not in use for the select board, we would ask that there be allow um, remote participation in this space if these changes can be made to it. Um, and right now I know that the ACMI um, folks have been it's instrumental in keeping things running and in when it's in hybrid format to keep things running. So that would be some, some technical changes would have to be made. We um, would like to identify ways to do um, to contemplate training and support for members of the boards, commissions, and committees how to run the meetings, because it may be good to share some best practices. And then we've identified a few places in the in our um, report, our interim report, one or two additional spaces. These baby rooms in the town hall annex, the lions room, and maybe rooms in the community center. We're not asking for a lot at this time, just a one or two to allow these pilots to start and um, this process to begin to be in some maybe smaller rooms and some larger room, like a smaller room and a larger room um, in those spaces. Our last slide is looking to the future. So this looks to the coming town hall meeting and beyond that. Um, we, towards the coming town hall meeting, we need to um, 
really um, be more definitive about the technology and um, and then and these guidelines that we're proposing for um, for these meetings. Um, we'd like to find a second wave of meetings. The goal would be eventually to make this opportunity available to all boards and commissions that want to do this or feel that they, you know, um, or, if the, or if the attending members want them to do it. But we'd like to do this in a somewhat staggered manner. Um, and then in this time, probably after town hall meeting based on when the legislation will realistically allow hybrid meetings to start happening, um, we'd like to gather information on what's working, what is, um, what needs, you know, what can be improved and share that. Um, and then as part of our other commission that we already started talking about is um, how can public bodies provide information back to the um, public on what they're doing. And, and one thing, this is kind of the, at the end of, um, not the end, but it was, an, it was an issue raised by many people on the surveys. Some people really like having um, remote access and aren't really that keen on hybrid. So that would require legislative change to maintain remote access quorum for boards that gather. And maybe obviously, maybe not for the select board, but you could picture some much smaller committees that don't often have guests or, um, or um, other people coming in. And they, um, and they may want to be able to meet remotely um, instead of in person, especially if the weather's terrible or, or somebody's traveling. So that would require, um, that's, that's under discussion, but we're considering how you may, we may, and other people may have to advocate for a legislature change for that. Um, so that's, um, that's it. I'd like to thank um, everybody on the committee. It has been an intense three, four months of work. Uh, we met every two weeks um, since October, um, pretty much. Um, we did take some time off around Thanksgiving and Christmas, but otherwise we've been going. And I'd like to thank the select board for their um, attention and support. Great, thank you very much, Mustafa. And thank you to the members of the committee who are here this uh, tonight, Jennifer Seuss and Alexander Bagnell and, and uh, Mr. Helmuth. Um, so I'll turn to board members for, for questions or, or comments and uh, start with Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I'd like to move receipt of the um, report. And, uh, and, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll say I especially like the last bullet point on here. And, and my understanding, too, is that it is on the governor's desk now to um, sign legislation that will allow all remote um, access going through the middle of July. So we have some more time um, with respect to what's currently in the current limit, you know, is, is April 1st. It does allow, it also allows for, I mean, not only these meetings, I mean, to be remote access, but also for us to do virtual town meeting. So fortunately, the legislature has moved in time so that we're not going to be scrambling come, you know, the in the March. Um, uh, and yeah, I noticed the survey I thought was excellent. I mean, really good survey, really good questions. I mean, it did seem to me in the survey from what I recall that the hybrid was kind of like the least um, desirable of, of the um, respondents. Uh, and so I'm all for pilots. I mean, and so, so we'll learn something from doing the pilot and, and hopefully the pilot will be constructed in a way that we can get a decent sense of how many people from the public actually care to show up in person uh, versus doing um, the remote. Uh, and I know that when the select board did its hybrid, I thought it was very good to have a select person, you know, in the virtual room to experience what the people who weren't you know, in the physical room were experiencing because, you know, it is different. You know, I found it okay, but certainly on a technical realm, in a technical area, you can have some audio problems. And if there isn't someone monitoring what's going on in the virtual room, uh, then you, know, you could have a, a not unequal experience because they won't be equal, but but certainly an inadequate experience, but that can be handled by the, the tech. Um, uh, my, my biggest criticism I mean, about this report though is the, um, if it's back on your first slide, is the, the um, where we talk, you mentioned the report or the paper um, by um, Einstein, um, Palmer, and I forget the third name, it starts with a G. And um, 
I have a lot of problems with the paper. I, mean, I read the paper. I mean, um, first problem is that, the, especially with its application to what we're dealing with here, is that they are really focused on housing. I mean, all their research is on housing meetings. I mean, and we are dealing with a much broader spectrum. I, mean, I deal a lot in the transportation transit world. I mean, and I'd like to see research being that that we looked at the participation and the type of participation you know, in that realm, because you can make the argument that homeowners are a smaller set be, of, of the population. Be, and when you come to transportation, you generally have a broader segment of the population involved. So, so I think before we say be, that the hybrid or, or remote be, doesn't increase participation or diversity of participation, we need to broaden it out from research that focuses solely on housing, which is what theirs does. And, and as I read through the paper, it, it, there were, I thought in, in certain sections, the conflation of, of concepts I mean, in order to try to make this point it, uh, and some, some outdated sources, I mean, one that talked about the online participation not increasing or online access not particip increased participation that was referenced in 1995, I mean, um, almost 30 years ago. So I dare I say we're in a different world. Uh, fortunately, uh, the salvation for the paper, I thought was at the end, I mean, where they say, well, I mean, a lot of this research is based on, on policies that, or, or, or projects that were in play I me mean, before the pandemic started. So it might be, uh, an element of, well, we're just kind of playing out, especially in the housing stuff, I mean, we're playing out engagement based on policies or, or projects I mean, that were in the pipeline before the pandemic. And it might be different once we get to projects that that have emerged I mean, since the online access has started. And they also said that we, we, we might be able to do things or get more participation if we actively I mean, work on it. So, so um, I, I I, um, so I don't know, to, the, the report is what the report is, you know, but I, I, I'm uncomfortable, it's, again, with, with the reference um, of the paper there. I, I, if anything, I'd love to have a discussion um, with the officers because I'm making this argument without them there to defend it. But if anyone from your group you know, um, wants to respond to my, my concerns, I'm all ears, but um, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, Seuss, did you want to say something? And, and you know, part of this maybe is is, is better um, at, at a separate time. But I want to give you an opportunity to respond to what Mr. Diggins said. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know many of, of Mr. Diggins' um, criticisms are are legitimate. Um, in that um, this paper was only looking at certain types of meetings. Um, we did hear some information um, from some of the committees that, in their experience in Arlington. That their own meetings were did not have the diversity that they'd hoped. So, for example, at Park and Rec, um, when they redid the park at Thompson, which is in you know in an area with lots of diversity and, and renters and stuff, um, they said they 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 had felt that they tried everything to try to get a wider group of people coming to the meetings and and weren't successful in it. So, I I don't think it I don't think that the um, the, what we should get out of this is that it is, is impossible to get a diverse representation at meetings in a hybrid or remote setting. I think we should just understand that we still have challenges that are not solved by the hybrid or remote um, meeting. That it, is just not enough. You know, you, you still have to do all the other things that you we've always needed to do. Thank, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hurd? Thank you. I'll uh, second Mr. Diggins' motion. Um, and I'll say, Mr. Diggins, if we're still on Zoom in July, I think my head might explode. So I, I think we can get on a quicker track than that, particularly since our board is already set up for this. Um, I want to thank the committee for all their work. Um, I think remote participation during the pandemic has been something that's emerged as a, as a huge benefit for people to participate in the public um, comment portions of our meetings. It's certainly for everyone under the circumstances. And, you know, I, I think going forward, it will, will all our, our meetings will always have an aspect of remote participation. Where I see it 
at least for our board, is that we have remote participation for public comment periods, like open forum for when we have hearings. And then otherwise we operate just generally like our boards have before, particularly for members, because our meetings just have always worked more efficiently. I've been in meetings before the pandemic and after the pandemic. And when we have meetings in the chamber where we're looking at each, each other, having a discussion, we're looking at people that are addressing concerns to us in the face, I, I always felt like it was a better conversation. So I am looking forward to getting back to that sort of structure where we're all together in the same room. But again, with the caveat that we developed the technologies, so where people wanna address the board through open forum or through public hearings that we open up the remote participation portal for that portion of the hearing. Um, but it's an ongoing process and we'll, we'll look at the feasibility of a lot of the suggestions. Um, I myself have no problem opening up the select board chambers if we're gonna make a significant financial investment into just a few locations. I think it is efficient to have as many meetings in each individual location as we can. And I agree with the idea that we need some, such as the Lions hearing room, wired up as well because you know it doesn't happen as much in our meetings but certainly the redevelopment board and the zoning board of appeals have had meetings that have had 50 to 100 people at the meeting where they've needed access in larger places so i think that's something that we definitely need to look at but i mean i think this is going to be a work in progress and i look forward to the further work of the of the working group and um having discussions with the public and my colleagues about where we go from here. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, and uh, thank you for God bless you meeting every two weeks. Um, <laughs> sort of like a select board meeting, minus the Warren article hearings. But um, one of the things uh, moving forward, and Mustafa touched on this, is um, come July. Um, some of the decisions may be made for us in terms of what it is um, we can or cannot do in terms of remote, hybrid, or other. Um, so I guess if for some reason it's not extended after July, uh, um, um, within two to four weeks before that, either the town manager or town council could advise the select board as the, I guess, executive body, executive branch, um, whether we're under the current laws or anything else that's applicable, can we say um, this is how you know we want to do hybrid, remote, whatever, um, and still not uh, run afoul of uh, open meeting laws or, or anything else, or, or something would need to be done that the um, select board could do that after our discussion and um, a majority, if not um, unanimous vote. Uh, from the select board. Um, I, I don't want to put town council on the spot, but it might, if I could ask an easy question for you, Mr. Chair, to town council, am I overthinking that? Um, or is that something we need to really look into if come July, the order is not extended? It's not something we can just do uh, as the executive body branch. Um, Attorney Hyde. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Yeah, that, that's correct. So right now, the board has authorized remote participation. And under the current law, the board can set more restrictive measures for remote participation, but it can expand remote participation beyond what's allowed under the uh, regulations of the open meeting law uh, promulgated by the Attorney General's office. So it'll be important to see what that legislation allows. The only other vehicle that you could uh, pursue um, to, to change that would be special legislation, but, you know, as folks know, generally speaking, they want to have a certain amount of uniformity when it comes to uh, uh, certain things like um, public transparency and stuff like that. So I think you've got it right. We'll need to see what that legislation says, because the default of the open meeting law is much more restrictive than the current uh, uh, special circumstances that we're in. And it kind of allows you to be more restrictive, but doesn't allow you to be more generous if you think there's certain bodies and there's an important exception with the disabilities commission but i, I think you've summarized it well okay and then um 
since we sort of have an in on the MMA, um, if for some reason um, it goes to July and does not get extended, I assume other cities and towns will sort of be faced with the same dilemma of go back to all in person or explore something else. So perhaps um, our town manager who's a president of MMA or president of something of MMA, I don't know if they started having these discussions or if you anticipate in the future that if it's not extended after July, that either cities and towns individually or through the MMA might have some um, combination of speaking with the voice. I can ask Mr. Chaplin. Mr. Chair, yes. yeah, Mr. Yeah, Chaplin. thank you, Mrs. Mahan. So I, I, I am no longer the president of the MMA. I'm just a, a, rank, a rank and file member. <laughs> Um, no, but I am I am aware that they, they have been lobbying and advocating quite hard for the extension or not even extension so much as a permanent uh, measure to be put in place to allow for, you know, more easily remote hybrid and in person meetings. I can check in on the status of their efforts, but I know for quite some time they've been advocating with legislators and the governor's office in that regard. Okay, and then the only other thing I would say, not that the committee doesn't have enough on its plate or its platter. Or <laughs> whatever receptacle is appropriate to get, make the analogy to is, you know, I, I was looking at the respondents and, and you know, 64, 64 uh, boards, commissions, committees, et cetera. Um, and I know, I think under hybrid, I think the highest respondents was like 28 to 38%. One of the things, and, and if it's in here, I missed it, I apologize, but um, if it could just be a straight out, um, survey of the 68 entities that you all have identified, um, if they can be given, I guess, three options. Um, if after no extension after July, um, what would that committee prefer or be leaning towards? Maybe not ask them to make it definitive, but what would they see they'd be leaning towards to go back to in-person only, um, remote by certain members or somebody else or three hybrid. And, and maybe there's a fourth question. So my thing is before we uh, talk about, um, you know, what spaces we do have currently set up to do remote hybrid, um, if we do expand them and it is a cost. And I know that I'm always along with the chair and others bringing in, you know, the override and long range planning committee. Um, we've really been given the charge and the steed to um, really buckle down and, and look at every little expense and, you know, the pennies, nickels, and dimes add up to a dollar. Also, um, I, I'm my right now, if I had my druthers, I'd say perhaps look at the um, O'Neill community room over at the community center police department, which is probably quasi set up, not totally. Um, but my thing is of the 64, if it comes back that only 12, you know, not counting school committee and select board because we are where we are, um, then that may determine um, if there's any further need to do that investment. Um, so I just put that out there just to kind of ruminate because I know this is just an interim report. We'll go forward. More things will be decided by July. Um, and I look forward to somehow finding out um, once we know what the parameters are, the best way we can um, deliver the services. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Helm. Thank you. Uh, thanks to my colleagues on the board, my colleagues on the committee. Uh, I have to say the members have worked really hard and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been an interesting work. Um, it's been a good discussion, and I'd like to offer perspective of someone who's been alongside this committee uh, on a couple of points. Uh, one of them is, I think, with respect to the research that Mr. Diggins engaged with, um, the weaknesses are absolutely legitimate, and were also acknowledged by the researchers um, when they when they spoke with us. The limitations, I should say, uh, of the applicability. Uh, but I do appreciate Ms. Seuss drawing out what we did here, a surprising to a surprising degree, and I don't think there's a fundamental conflict here. The consensus of the remote committee is very pro remote access. Make no mistake about that. Uh, this re research notwithstanding, I think the illuminating point for me in this research is that allowing remote access does may not automatically or inherently bring greater representation. 
And I think it's important to know that because that suggests the course of action, that if that's the case, um, and, we, and we see some qualitative evidence or suggestions of that, even talking with our own committees, uh, we are going to need to do more than just set the technology up. Um, we, were, we will need to really work on outreach. And I appreciate uh, Mustafa saying, uh, you know, this doesn't necessarily just dump this on the DEI coordinator. This probably needs to be something that's more infused throughout our government, uh, an ethos of, of civic engagement um, and, and, and bringing people in and helping them believe that this increased access is for them too. Um, the, the second thing I would say just about costs, because that's that's absolutely the right question. Uh, we've looked a lot at this uh, and this board and the town manager will have to make some decisions, but uh, these kinds of expenses are directly eligible for ARPA funds. Um, CARES Act probably covers some of them. Some of them there's that. And I know Mr. Feeney and his, his infinite skill has been creatively applying for grants um, from sort of the disability access into this. The, the committee is actually not at this point I don't think we we believe that this would necessarily incur um, general operating budget uh, impacts uh, it, with the consideration of ARPA particularly, um, which in other communities are using ARPA and have used CARES Act funding to set this up. And part of the purpose of that is to not only accommodate public health, public health situation with remote access to public meetings, but also to, con to contemplate sort of some future proofing for you know, where this pandemic or other epidemics may, may get us. Um, but, but the cost is certainly something that we will need to further investigate after we get a sense from this board. Um, another point that, that came up uh, was um, what happens after July. If the, if the governor and the legislature do agree that all remote access goes through July, um, we still can deploy hybrid remote access without any change in the law. Um, our understanding of that, that um, a, a majority, a quorum of the body has to be physically present. So there would have to be some people in the room and, you know, but any, any participants who aren't on the board or commission can be remote and probably a sub quorum of, of members could be, uh, could be remote, just as we did, um, you know, in, in, in the select board chambers. So I say that because um, I'd like to suggest a friendly amendment to Mr. Diggins motion um, that we not only receive this, but we actually start moving on, on um, looking into doing the pilot. Because I think this is one thing we, we learned is this is complex enough um, that trying to roll this out to 60 boards and commissions at once is not at all feasible. We want to roll this out to a small number of groups that are interested and the public is interested in seeing, learn from that, because um, there'll be some hiccups, you know, and, and get some insight in, into the technology, into the budgeting and all this, into the staffing that, that may be required. There's a lot of questions. So do this in a pilot, try to do that in the second half of this year, um, and then see where we're at. Um, so I, I would, uh, with Mr. Diggins' assent, he can speak to this after, I, after I'm done um, with, with my talking, but suggest that we move receipt and also refer to the town manager to study uh, budget and implementation considerations from this report and then return to this board uh, with recommendations for further discussion um, relating to implementing um, a pilot study this year. And, um, and the last thing I'll say is, um, so I attended a speaking of the MMA and by the way, Mr. Chapman was, mis was mistaken. He is not just an ordinary member. He is immediate past president. It says so on the website. So there you go. Um, but I, I attended an MMA webinar on this very topic uh, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things that was really resonated with me, and I think we should pay attention to, is that our constituents expect a digital first experience with everything in their lives, and their government is not an exception. And I'm enough of a traditionalist, I don't, I don't personally want to contemplate a world where we do everything digitally. And I, I know I, I'm, there may be some difference of opinion on this board about that. Uh, but, but I think that from the residents' point of view, participation in the government, the, you know, we have all moved to all remote. And I think a lot of people have been surprised and even pleasantly surprised at, about how much easier it is uh, to be involved in their government in, in public meetings. So I think that we would do wise to take this opportunity with some, maybe some funding from ARPA, from CARES, whatever, um, and the opportunity to hardworking people on this committee to start moving. 
um, and get ready to and, and get ready to roll this out because I think our public is going to expect it. And if you know, and and um, once we're back to meeting in person, it's going to be a, a, a change for some people, and not just the public, but there will be some members of boards and commissions who have realized that they enables their public service if they're able to use these tools. Um, so this is you know not just a pandemic response. I think that we are in a good way stuck with this. Um, and so I would uh, encourage us to just seize that leadership mantle and, and anticipate uh, what our constituents and our, and our residents and volunteers will be wanting. So um, anyway, and I, I know that was a long spiel. There was a, a friendly amendment buried in that and also a friendly shot at my friend who made the, made the, uh, made the proposal. So I'll, I'll, I'll shush and uh, let the chair sort it out. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Allen. Mr. Diggins, is that acceptable for a, a, a friendly amendment? To uh, yes, it is. And then a after um, you, you talk, Mr. Chair, I, mean, I, I have a, a question and then one short comment. It's okay. okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I just have a couple of comments. And I also want to thank the committee for all their hard work. Mr. Helmuth has kept me up to date from time to time in terms of what's been going on. I know you've been doing quite a bit. I did answer one of your survey questions and, and I certainly, um, on, on your rank recommendations, certainly would encourage and support hybrid participation for committees going forward. I mean, we, we, we saw that it, it, it works with the, with the public and would I prefer that all five of us were in the select board chambers tonight? Absolutely, but if we were, I certainly would wanna allow for um, remote participation as part of our meetings. Um, just a question on, you had identified different rooms that could be equipped for future hybrid uses, but the range of costs there were, and I know these are estimates was from 3000 to $125,000. And I imagine the Lions hearing room might be done on the higher end of that, but are, are there some room, or maybe maybe not, I, just, I see it, it shaking your head, but are there some rooms that are, you, you think will be easier at the lower end that maybe we could get going on sooner rather than later? Um, well, I can give a very short answer, but then I'd like to ask Alex to maybe give a little bit more details, but there are um, technologies that would work well for five people sitting around the table, for example. And Alex, I don't know if you want to go into some more details on that. I'd, I'd second that. I'd say it's less about the room itself and more about the meeting that you're trying to accommodate and make remote. And then if we're talking about a meeting with five people and a single remote person and uh, new materials to present, that's a lot cheaper to accommodate than something say like the ARB where you might want two screens more than a you know a couple of cameras have a significant number of people in the audience and remote um, and then on top of that which room are you in so so it's kind of a two-part thing okay all right and, and and just a comment I I do think you you make a really good point there there are some committees that we found here um, that remote may be the best way to go um, as we go forward and, and you know, I've seen that with some of the committees that I'm a liaison to smaller that I, I think it might be preferable. So I'm glad you're, you're looking into that as, as, as a potential um, recommendation uh, as, as we go forward on that. So um, Mr. Diggins, did you want to add, add, add something further? Yeah. So, so a, a quick question and perhaps it's to one of the members of the um, committee or, or to, to us meet up, and that is that, um, are, was there any exploration of, for the me meetings that are hybrid and recording them and then making them available in, um, uh, on YouTube or something um, later on? Because I think that's one good element I mean, of, of the use of this technology is that everything can be recorded easily. That was definitely part of the, um, that was the public survey question. Um, I don't remember the exact answer, but basically I think it was the middle answer in terms of people would prefer that it be recorded and be available for some considerable amount of time, but it didn't seem like forever. Um, and we've heard, um, um, and Alex or, or Jennifer can, can correct me, but basically the you know, video takes up a lot of room and the town has a lot of meetings that go for a lot of time. So even though storage is cheap, it does add up. Um, so there was some con com discussion around the costs and we don't have answers. We don't have specific estimates or anything, but um, definitely people would like the, people would, people want the idea of the recordings. It wasn't clear how many people would use the recordings. That that was to, to be 
to be quite honest about all this. Um, you know, I'm not sure, um, but I think for a sake of record, it would be very nice to have the recordings when people do want to go back and see them. Um, one gauge is how many people watch the ACMI YouTube videos. And it's not a big number, but I'm sure for those that watched it, it was important. So um, I don't know if there's other answers. Well, I mean, I think maybe Ms. Seuss, did you? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I thought I saw Ms. Seuss raise her hand. I'm not sure. Yeah, it, so I think there was one question about whether, in terms of cost, whether a meeting was recorded and available to the public for a certain length of time, where it's being recorded and sort of shoved someplace so that so, somebody asked you could bring, give it to them. Um, and I think that the former was a lot more expensive than what we understood. So there could be a hybrid approach um, in terms of storing and making meetings available. Um, and I, I definitely think that this should be part of what the pilot um, is, is studying and trying to learn from. I mean, so, so the, the, a quick comment based on this and a question to, um, to Mr. Heim, you know, I mean, I, I'll say that we, the, I wouldn't expect me that people would watch the entire video, that they would just go in for the information that they need, you know, see it and then, and then, and then, you know, leave, you know. And so the question to Mr. Heim is, it, would there be any problem, any legal problem with us putting these recorded videos on YouTube, thereby bypassing the whole cost issue? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Attorney Heim. Um, th there's, there's a, a very, um, high level question. It's not actually just limited to YouTube. It's about what happens when the government utilizes private vendors to upload content. You don't own that content anymore. Um, so th that's an interesting question. It doesn't, it's not just limited to this. We're not necessarily in control of that content. Um, uh, YouTube is very convenient for a number of reasons. Uh, it's hard to project what a technology like that or a platform like that would be like 10 years from now. Uh, I, I don't see an immediate legal problem. It doesn't, uploading something onto YouTube doesn't obviate us from having to comply with keeping meeting minutes and other things like that. It's just another way to capture the same type of thing. So my answer is in, in the short run, not, it's not a legal acute problem. Uh, in the long run, it's sort of a uh, interesting uh, question about how to handle not just YouTube, but other, other platforms, including social media. And my final comment is kind of based on what Mr. Helmet said towards the end, and that is, we, I don't think we can capture this or study this in the pilot, but I think we need to be concerned about the possibility that, that people you know, who like remote will gravitate towards the opportunities that provide that. I mean, um, and so there's only so much time in the day to read and, and, and those of us who like trying to do a lot, I mean, are going to, you know, gravitate towards groups that allow us to do that. I mean, and so you may find I me mean, that you get a different kind of distribution in participants because you don't offer the remote um, capability. So just something to keep in mind. I don't know if you can try to design the pilot to see if you can capture that because right now we're in a world that's kind of all remote. And we haven't gone into a world where what well, people can do whatever, like maybe government is limited towards hybrid or, or only in person and then non-government can do what it wants. So one more reason for us to lobby to make sure that we, we provide more access. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, okay, and again, thank you again, each one of you for all the work that uh, you're doing on the, on the committee and, and we look forward to um, more reporting and, and from you as we go forward. Um, so on a motion by Mr. Diggins as amended by Mr. Helmuth to receive the report and refer to the town manager for a review of budget implications of a, a pilot program, uh, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Um, yes, and I wasn't paying attention. I heard Mr. Diggins. Um, who seconded that? So Mr. Diggins' motion originally was seconded by Mr. Hurd, and then Mr. Helmuth offered an amendment that I took Mr. Diggins' um, acceptance of it as a second. Thank you. Yes. Sorry. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Um,
item 12 this evening. And then one thing I will say, I thought we had 17 topics of interest tonight, but I know people will come and go during during these meetings. <laughs> it's just a joke on the uh, survey results there. Uh, item 12, <laughs> upper investment in affordable housing, request from Housing Corporation of Arlington, Jennifer Rake, Director of uh, the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development. Is Ms. Rake, she had a meeting tonight. I don't know if she's able to join. Yeah, so if, if it pleases the board, yeah, Ms. Ms. Rake's at the Redevelopment Board tonight, so we discussed this matter before the meeting and give, frankly, given the uncertainty of when it would come up on the agenda, we agreed that I would present this to the board. So this is a matter that was brought to us by the Housing Corporation of Arlington after they had previously sought funding from the Community Preservation Act or from the Community Preservation Committee to basically close out the Downing Square Broadway initiative. So I know a number of us were at the ribbon cutting um, several months ago. Uh, they are getting very close to lease up now. Um, I did reach out to the executive director, uh, interim executive director of the HCA today. I believe they have one tenant under agreement with a series of other tenants, hopefully soon to be under agreement to be leasing up. Uh, but with all that said, there were a number of factors that led to the project um, having a budget shortfall when all was said and done. There was a combination of factors some driven by site remediation costs going over budget, some construction costs going over budget, and a series of other factors. Um, the CPA committee ultimately decided that funding a retrospective project wasn't the best and most appropriate use of CPA funds. And actually, I believe the chair of the CPA recommended that they talk with me and then ultimately the select board about potentially using some ARPA funds to help them close out the project. Um, as is delineated in the memorandum that was provided to the board, they have gone to a number of other sources to help them close out. They've received funding from the North Suburban Consortium, some funds from DHCD, and they came to us. They ultimately said, we still have a $638,000 shortfall to close. Um, would the town be willing to help with some funding source, most likely ORPA? And myself and Ms. Raid had a discussion with both members of the board and the interim executive director of the housing corporation. And at that point said, if we are able to say 319,000, half of the 638, could you go back to DHCD and see if they would cover that other half, the other 50%. And they said that they think that would likely have a positive outcome and they would do it. And amazingly enough, the next day, DHCD responded saying that they would fund um, that portion if the town did affirmatively fund this $319,000 amount. So I would recommend that the board uh, endorse this expenditure of ARPA funds. It helps close out this important project in town and helps the HCA be able to both lease up and move on to whatever its next project may be in town. And I would recommend that we take it out of the line that has yet, not yet been fully endorsed in terms of details of affordable, uh, affordable housing unit production which of course would make less dollars available for future production, but helps close out this project and, and you know, get, get these apartments filled and again, help the HCA move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chapelain. Uh Mr. Helmer. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to move approval. And, uh, and I wanna express my appreciation for Mr. Chapelain, not only to uh, contemplate this, but for, his really skillful work um, in in getting the state to cover um, half half of this need. I think that's you know that's pretty extraordinary and uh, just speaks to. I mean, we're, it's we're, we're very used to this high level of of, of stewardship in the town, but it's always appreciated. And I think in the service of helping HCA, um, it's it's especially valuable. Yeah, and I have, I have no problem doing this with the with the ARPA adjustment. I think that. Um, you know, HCA is a viable organization that will produce future uh, housing units. So I think, you know, I, I have no problem doing that because I think that, yeah, you know, we are, we're assisting them with the very, very recent production of using housing. And it was, I was delighted to be at the ribbon cutting and to tour the units. They are fantastic. I um, mean, there's a lot of them. So it's helping people live in our community. It's helping us with, with our progress towards uh, safe harbor status someday with 40B. Um, and I think the ACA will continue to do that, and this, these funds will, you know, will, will make it possible for them to make sure they can move forward on, on safe footing. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. I will certainly second um, Mr. Helmuth's motion to move approval to endorse um, because this is opera funding and the way I understand this, and I may come out negative, but I'm saying it as a positive that um, uh, ultimately the decision um, under the US Treasury guidelines is the, the case of Arlington with our town manager. Um, but instead of um, him just making that decision, he's done as he's done with other facets of the opera funding, he's come to the board and, and, and asked for our endorsement and recommendation. And I just want to double check with uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Chapterling, that, that's the case of what we're doing again here tonight. Mr. Chapterling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Y yes, Mrs. Mahan, that yeah, absolutely. And, and my plan going forward would continue to be every every ARPA program that's yet to be endorsed, I would want to bring back before the board as in order to create both board input, but a public process for the expenditure of the funds. And, and thank you. And I honestly am highlighting that in a positive way that while um, the law, if you go strictly to the letter of the law, it is the town manager, him in this case, in the future someday, 10, 20 years down the road, perhaps hers. Um, but I do appreciate the fact that um, Mr. Chapdelaine, as he's done in the past and is continuing to do, is not just unilaterally laterally making decisions, which would be his right to do, but is really continuing to foster not just the relationship with the board um, to come back and, and get our input and recommendations, but also as an extension to um, the public at large that um, these decisions are not made in a vacuum, which they could be, um, but the town manager is endeavoring to um, not only involve myself and my colleagues, but also to get the information out as widely in a forum as you can. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy to uh, second Mr. Helmut's motion. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to support this. I think this is a really important project for Arlington, but it's also the type of project that fits kind of squarely in the allowance that we set aside to commit the ARPA funds to more increased to increase affordable housing units in town. So I think this is the perfect example of how we should spend those monies for that purpose. So happy to support it. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. Yes, I'm happy to support it too. And, and uh, I was wondering why the CPA didn't approve and I understand their rationale. So that makes me even more comfortable uh, moving forward. And I really uh, am thrilled with the collaboration mean, um, in the region, the North Suburban um, Consortium throwing in 100K, I mean, that that just makes me feel good about regional support for housing and, of course, the state stepping in with um, 319K. So all around, just a good um, good effort being by, by, um, the, by the residents um, and the leaders in the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to support this as well. And, and um, for us, as Mr. Chaplin said, uh, approving 319,000, it's essentially a match from, the, from DHCD on, on 319,000. So this is 48 units of affordable housing that we wanna see filled as quickly as possible. And I, and I think this will help HCA do that. And um, also will probably help Arlington Eats move into the Broadway location because there may be a relationship there in terms of when the work is done. We certainly wanna see that uh, happening as soon as possible. So on a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, uh, Attorney Hein. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. Uh, item 13, review and approve select board goals. Um, Mr. Chapter Lane had sent us the uh, revisions to the goals, but I would turn it to him um, for any comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Given the hour, I, I think I would suffice to say that I, I have updated the goals document as provided to the board uh, per the discussion we had um, at the close of uh, last calendar year. I think I captured everything that was discussed in the meeting. Um, there's very, very much a chance that I didn't fully capture anything, so I'd be open to answering any questions, making any additions or revisions, or if it suits the board tonight, um, approving these goals would also 
be fine, then we can build them into the budget documents going forward as well. Okay, uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I went to the select board's office, they printed out, out the, um, oh, the goals and they're sitting downstairs in an envelope. So I don't wanna run away. And, um, I did go through them um, while I was in the office very quickly. And um, I do wanna thank the town manager and the chair for um, sort of, I don't wanna say backfilling, but um, as both said they would do um, around the Al Life um, CSO issue, um, putting language in there. I read it um, this morning and I started to think about adding different things, whether it's, you know, NIP, well, I think NIPTES is in there, but, you know, DEP, EPA, but um, then I reread it again and it's, it's broad enough and general enough that I think if I get into any specifics, it would limit it. So um, I, I think we have an appropriate placeholder in there for that. Um, and um, I know that the chair and the town manager on that issue um, are also uh, working with the time frameworks we have before us. So um, I would move to approve um, the uh, select board goals as compiled, compiled by the chair and the town manager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. I'm Mr. Hurd. I'll second that motion and look forward to acting on our goals. <clears throat> Thank you, Sorry. Mr. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you. I'm happy to support it. Maybe just add, you know, putting Mr. Hurt's head back together when it explodes, but that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Helmut. No questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm happy to support it as well. And thank you to the uh, town manager who did the uh, primary work putting putting this together following our meeting. So uh, on a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Hein. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Dickens? Yes. Mr. Helmut? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, and I apologize for not muting myself. My clearing of the throat was not any subliminal message. It was my blood pressure medicine kicking in. So thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Chairman Ms. Fuller. Okay, thank you. Uh, item 14, update and discussion, uh, MUGAR. And um, I was going to turn it over to Attorney Heim for a brief uh, overview in terms of what has happened. I think the last time we talked about this, the ZBA had issued their decision. Um, the abutters surrounding the MUGAR site have filed an appeal or, uh, in the Superior Court. The applicant, Oak Tree, um, has filed an appeal in the Housing Appeals Committee. So. Attorney Jaime, if you could just give us a little bit of uh, information on the procedural posture, and I have a few comments and maybe some potential action items or discussion as far as where we, we go as a board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try to be brief. Um, just to uh, sort of recap, this all stems from an August 31st, 2016 application by Arlington Land Realty for a comprehensive permit, the site known as the Mugar Woods, to build a... Um, uh, 40B uh, apartment complex in a series of townhouses. Uh, on November 22nd, 2021, the ZBA issued their decision on that. Um, that decision by the ZBA was appealed by Arlington Land Realty. Uh, and I'm going to summarize this a little bit uh, based on really two grounds. One, that certain conditions in that decision rendered the project uneconomic. And secondly, that it was outside, some conditions were outside the scope of 40B. Uh, around the same time, uh, Butters appealed as well. They appealed, however, to Superior Court. Um, and their basis in very, very short summary is basically that uh, some of the, uh, the, the decision itself was faulty and that there was some information that the decision lacked that it should have had before rendering it. Uh, what happens when you have two appeals essentially simultaneously from Butters and from an applicant? is the applicant's appeal to the Housing Appeals Committee takes precedent. So the Superior Court action under Chapter 40A by the abutters is essentially stayed um, while the Housing Appeals Committee's examination of the applicant Arlington Land Realty's arguments are assessed. The abutters also filed a motion to intervene um, in that action. So they're essentially joining it. Um, the current 
the most current update on that action is that um, the HSC wanted the parties to engage in uh, sort of the mediation to see if the issues could be resolved. The uh, ZBA took the position that they were interested in that only if the abutters were also going to be uh, a part of that mediation, uh, because that's the only way that there would be some sort of final resolution to uh, the inherent disputes involved. Um, I'm not sure that that mediation is going to happen. Uh, it's not 100% clear to me, but um, obviously, if there was some resolution that was mutually satisfactory to abutters, the ZBA, um, and by association, the town and the applicant, then that would resolve the matter. Absent that, however, I think we're probably looking at anywhere from a year to 18 months uh, for an HAC decision to be litigated. And how that primarily happens is by pre-filed testimony. But um, after that, uh, assuming that the HAC decision is either in favor of uh, the applicants or the ZBA, it doesn't really matter, the abutter suit would then proceed in superior court, which I would expect to be another 12 to 18 months, maybe more than that. So um, just to give a time frame for all of this, we're probably looking at about three years uh, at the earliest before this uh, matter would be resolved if it was litigated to its uh, end conclusion. Um, obviously, in the meantime, there's a number of things to be thought about by the ZBA, by this board. I did speak with special counsel, attorney Witten, in advance of this meeting. He'd be happy to um, meet with the entirety of the board um, in an executive session to provide uh, a attorney-client communication, essentially, about the status of the case. And of course, I'm at the ready to do that as well. So with that, Mr. Chair, if that's a satisfactory sort of base rundown of the posture, um, I'll look forward to any discussion from the board. Okay, th thank you, Attorney Hyman. And I just have a few comments before I um, open it up to, to, to board members. And I just want to elaborate a little bit on um, what, what Attorney Hyman said. And, and uh, Mrs. Mahan and I had had a meeting recently with uh, Attorney Hyman and uh, Ms. Mr. Chapelain regarding concerns about um, conservation issues with the with 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 the um, parcel and and the decision itself and um, one thing again we, we weren't a party to the uh, to the matter the ZBA issued its decision um, and they they issued put in place several conditions on the site um, post approval conditions and and one of them I'm going to refer to and and uh, talk about a little bit but but maybe suggest to the board that we do take up Attorney Witten's offer to meet with him in executive session. Um, concerns, conditions that happen after the fact. And one of those conditions is to test the groundwater elevation at the site. And um, there are other conditions that were put in there as well in terms of the applicant funding a cleanup of the site before they do any work on the conservation, so-called conservation parcel and, and uh, also put money into escrow to allow the town or a organization to clean up the site and, and restore um, the conservation area there. The applicant filed its appeal and essentially objected to all of the conditions and, and any condition that was post decision. And that would include a testing requirement, which they had agreed to. It would include their funding um, the cleanup. Now they may come back and say they are arguing in the alternative, but we've got to take their appeal for what's written on it. And they, they made very general objections to the entire decision. Then they made some specific objections to various conditions. And I, I, I think you know, for us, we've been going through this as a town for a number of years. There are significant environmental concerns on that site and environmental concerns that do have to do with groundwater flooding, localized flooding and stream flooding. And to have the applicant say they were gonna do something and now see them um, filing an action to the Housing Appeals Committee challenging conditions, I find very disappointing. And I was gonna go into a little bit more detail on this conservation testing issue but after talking to Attorney Heim, I think it's best in hearing the offer that we received tonight. I think it's best for the board to have that session with Attorney Witten to talk about options and, and, and talk about where things stand on that issue. 
The second thing I want to say, and this has to do with the additional land there um, that the site proposed for development, I'm going to round, is between five and six acres. That leaves about 12 acres that would be known as the conservation parcel. And there was a requirement to, for Oak Tree or the applicant to fund a cleanup before any part of that um, parcel is transferred, whether it be through a conservation restriction or whether it be transferred to the town. Now they are um, within their appeal challenging in a general way, even that condition. And my feeling on that is, and the town manager had sent a, a memo or letter to the ZBA back in March of 2021 in terms of what conditions the town would like to see if there ever was to be a transfer of the open space parcel. And one of those conditions was that the site would be cleaned up. So if the applicant is now taking the position through their pleadings that they are going to challenge this decision, I think it behooves us as a town or as a board to reach out to members of the Conservation Commission to see what the extent of their authority is for potential enforcement actions. Because why should we wait to see what happens with this appeal? If they don't wanna work with us and this has been held off before and there's been discussions, but again, I'm gonna take them for what's in their pleadings. If this is the route that they wanna go down, I think we as a board should be talking to the Conservation Commission whether it be a smaller group of the, of the board or whether it be at a, a full meeting to say, what are, what are the actions the Conservation, Conservation Commission can take? Um, one, to see what type of compliance there is on the site since the cleanup and, and, and whether any further, further enforcement action is necessary. So I'd like to highlight that right now for the board, but also suggest that if we could reach some consensus for a future meeting to meet with council to talk about some of these other sensitive um, issues relating to the appeals and, and to the environmental conditions. So um, with that, I, I will go in the same order as the last item. Um, Mrs. Mahan and I had met on this issue, so I'm gonna start with her uh, for any further comments. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And you definitely encapsulated anything that I would say um, at a public meeting, um, and I, I definitely uh, want to hear from my colleagues on the board, but um, I think a good next step, as you have suggested, and Attorney Hine, is um, the executive session with our, our um, co-counsel, Attorney Whitten, because um, I really don't want to go into discussing possible legal, um, I don't want to say machinations, but legal avenues that this board could explore um, because that's definitely more befitting for uh, a executive session. So I'll just leave it at that and I'd be interested in hearing from my, as you are, from my other three colleagues about um, readjourning this in an executive session with Attorney William, Attorney yep, William, Attorney Whitten, Heim, and the town manager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the update. Um, yeah, I agree. I, I think from this board's perspective, as far as our next steps and the strategies that we can take to fight the, pro the project, the best avenue is to first meet with Attorney Whitten and we can have those discussions and kind of formulate our plan from there. So I agree with that and I support going down that road. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, yes, I support it. And uh, I, I definitely would like to have the executive session. It'll give me time to go back and watch the recording of what you just said. That was quite the explanation. <laughs> and, and, and I need to review it because there's a lot there. And, and, and I'll learn a lot more in the executive session. So I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Helmet. Thank you. Yeah, I strongly concur with, uh, with the chair's line of argument and proposed action. Great, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Attorney Hine, did you want to add anything further? Or I don't know if that's, I mean, we will, we can coordinate it. And, and I think we have a consensus. We don't necessarily need a vote. I will schedule an executive session and coordinate with Attorney Hine, but I don't know if you wanted to add anything further on this. Well, I think the board's uh, stated well, uh, what its concerns and uh, motivations are for wanting to talk about this further, so. 
especially given the hour, I think I'm almost set. Thank you. Mr. Okay, okay. Th thank you, Attorney Heim. So I, I will um, move on to the next items on our agenda, which is correspondence received. I'm gonna uh, take them all in order and then, and then ask for action from the board. Item 15, a request for crosswalk on Mass Ave, Alexander Finley, 1490 Mass Ave. Item 16, return of community events, Elizabeth Locke, Chamber of Commerce, Executive Director. And item 17, comments regarding overnight parking pilot program, Steve Revelock, uh, 111 Sunnyside Ave. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Um, so I will move to refer item one and three to the town manager. Um, I don't know if he, if he has any opinion as to whether or not he can handle that through his office or whether we should uh, refer those to TAC. Mr. Chaplain. So I think on one, I can at least start with the senior transportation planner, Mr. Amstutz, in drafting a response uh, as a as a preliminary response. Yeah, and then move receipt of item number two. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Diggins. Uh, well, I I will second that, but I I'm inclined to make a friendly amendment that me three we um, go to. Uh, well, the chair and myself have received it, me, but it seems like it's referring more to that pilot, and we're yeah. working on that. And uh, um, of course, in concert with you all, but to the extent open meeting law allows me and the town manager, but I think it would really go to to us. So, um, yeah, that's fine. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmer. Yeah. Um, Second that, or it needs, needs to be, um, and happy to support that. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mrs. Mahan. <clears throat> um, did Mr. Diggins second that or Mr. Hellman? Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Diggins sec seconded Mr. Hurd's motion and his okay. friend amendment was seconded by Mr. Hellman. Okay, so I, I'm, I just have it down that Mr. Hurd, uh, and there's a reason I'm doing this. Um, there's been power outages all over town. Uh, Mr. Hurd, move receipt of correspondence received, refer to the town manager number 15 and number 17. Thank you, all set. Thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And I have no further comments on that. So uh, on a motion originally by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Hine. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Okay. Uh, new business, Attorney Hine. No new business, thank you. Mr. Chapdelaine. Uh, two pieces of new business. One, I wanted to share with the board that I've had a series of meetings with town council, the moderator and assistant moderator, the town clerk, and the director of health and human services to begin talking about town meeting preparation for this year. And the, the short version is that we are going to plan on parallel tracks for both an in-person town meeting and or, uh, or, or a virtual town meeting, given the uncertainty of both the trajectory of the virus, as well as an uncertainty about what statutory allowances we'll have at that time, we thought it was most prudent to plan for both. If we do meet live, the current thought uh, for in-person would be to have town meeting take place either in the red gym at the high school or potentially in the new auditorium uh, as both of those options would provide more space for people than the town hall would. So I think this will be an ongoing matter obviously that we work on over the course of the next few months leading up to town meeting, but I did want to share with the board and the public what our preliminary thinking and planning efforts would be focused on. The next matter, um, and I'm sure this might be a theme for our new business, is I just wanted to thank the whole team at DPW for back-to-back -back challenging storms, very different in their condition, uh, very much the same in the level of work and the number of hours that crews had to put in. Um, the DPW team did a great job tackling uh, over 20 inches of snow in Arlington a little over a week ago. And then with only an inch or two of ice and muck in sleet had to work for the same amount of time and equally did 
a very good job keeping the roads safe um, and residents as safe as possible. So I just wanted to give a public thanks to those teams who have worked a lot of hours over the past week tackling winter in New England. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chapelain. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, thank you. No new business, but I would like to heartily uh, second everything Mr. Chapelain just said about our DPW crews and their hard work. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Diggins. No new business. Thank you. Mr. Hurd. Uh, no new business other than to also just want to thank the DPW. Um, there was some concern over whether or not our Saturday hockey games were canceled, which was a big hit to me as a crazy hockey dad. But there was concern whether we'd have any Sunday hockey games and to the work of people like our wonderful DPW, we did have Sunday hockey games. So I was able to calm down a little bit. <laughs> thank, I'm thank, done. thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mrs. Mahan. Um, two items on the... Uh, Town manager's report regarding town meeting um, definitely would be in, will be interested in that and um, would assume that if we did do it at the high school in the auditorium, um, I haven't checked lately. Uh, I'm assuming the elevators, if they're not already functioning, they will be by then. Um, for those that can't do the stairs, and then um, regarding the uh, women and men over uh, the Department of Public Works. I've been posting every day from, uh, I always do it from different town Facebook pages and the like, but um, as most people know, and we all know, the, it wasn't just the actual storm itself, but it's been the storm cleanup. <clears throat> and even as recently as yesterday, last night, it, you know, and I've been through all the cities and towns, not only getting Mass Ave curb to curb so you can park, but I live near the Audison Middle School and, and um, getting those snow mounds and, and making sure that the ramps, whether you're in a stroller or you're physically handicapped and you need those, as well as I've made my runs down um, the other schools, um, they really pushed back those corners and um, made it accessible for any, anybody that um, really can't be climbing mounds of snow. So I spoke briefly to the town manager and now, um, sort of hit you all up later in terms of um, maybe doing a D'Agostino's sort of early dinner or lunch thing um, that we can all chip in for, because um, we can use town funds for that, but um, uh, just to sort of thank you. Um, you know, didn't want to do it while they're out there, you know, working, um, getting all this stuff done and probably have 15, 20 minutes for a break, but um, I'd like to do something with you all um, just sort of as a, a food thank you to all of them. And I just want to ask the chair, am I correct? Do we have an executive session tonight? We do. We do. Okay, no further new business. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And I, I also want to echo my colleagues thanking the DPW for the great work that they did. These were long duration storms and 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 uh, really, um, really took a lot to, to, to clear the streets and they did a great job. And uh, also some, the town continues to put some great pictures on the website of the DPW in action. And there's actually a short film that I saw that uh, was really impressive as well. So thank, thank you. Um, so that will conclude new business. Um, as I just mentioned, we do have an executive session, um, which is to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law or federal grant and aid requirements. And the specific item is the approval of executive session minutes of January 10th, 2022. Um, could I have a motion to go into executive session, um, Mrs. Mahan? Uh, so moved, and I just want to double check. Um, when we come out, is it for the purposes of to adjourn, or is it to come back out into public session um, as a result of any action we may take in executive session regarding the minutes? Just, just to adjourn. Okay, so move to go into executive session when we come out of executive session for the purposes to adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Okay. The motion's made by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Okay, We're great. in executive session. Okay, and if I could ask if there are any participants who were watching through Zoom, if they could log off 
at this time. And then once that is clear, we will begin the executive session.